we're about to start, so we would appreciate if you guys take a seat and then we start rolling. Wait for the curator. Hiya. <laughs> Welcome to Savvy Contemporary. Uh, does everyone hear me back there? More or less? Um, Pranav, do you mind increasing the volume a little bit? Check, check, check. Um, yeah, so I'll try again. Welcome to Savvy Contemporary. Savvy, um, this year actually turned 10 years old, and um, it's a project space that, that has been founded by um, Dr. Bonaventure Nidikung, along with, of course, many people who uh, also started out uh, in Neukölln. This was founded in uh, 10 years back, and c um, it, sorry, for, sorry for being <laughs> stage nervous. Um, I could speak a lot about the space, but um, what I would like to say that is a space which tries to look into, uh, investigate in, into processes of unlearning and decanonizing, and we do this with multiple projects that are being, um, yeah, that manifest out of the space through the energy of almost uh, 30 people um, who engage with the space uh, in form of different projects based upon their interest and of course under the guidance of the artistic directors. So um, just to give you an idea um, and to thank the people who make the space happen, I'm gonna read the names out of the people who are currently active in Savvy Contemporary. So Savvy Contemporary is Elena Agudio, Antonio Alampi, Antonia Alampi, Yasmina Alcaesi, Lynn Hanbalat Bad Helbok, Bonabel, Marlon Boschen, Federica Boeti, Pia Chakraborty Berthwein, Onur Chimen, Olani Evunet, Irene Fontedaki, Billy Fovo, Raisa Galofe, Juan Pablo Garcia Sosa, Monilola Ilupeju, Ahmed, Ahmed Ismaldin, Ismal Anna Yega, Kimani Joseph, Manmeet Kaur, Laura Klockner, Cornelia Knoll, Kelly Krugman, Manu Lodi, Antonio Mendes, Camila Metvali, Wilson Mugai, Arlette Luis da Cose, Bonaventure Nidikung, Abhishek Nilamba, Jeff Obero, Elena Quinterelli, Jörg Peter Schulze, Lemma Seacord, Lily Samogi, Elsa Westreicher, and Ola Zielinska. <laughs> 
And this is Abhishek Nilambe, by the way. And my name is Laura Klackner. Um, this year is the fifth year that we've been collaborating with Forum Expanded. Um, so each year on the occasion of Berlinale, Savi invites one filmmaker or a collective to um, exhibit their research material of their archives around their cinematic practice. So this can be texts, um, objects, notes, extra footage that is collected in the process of filmmaking. Mm, what we are interested in is shedding light on what you don't see when you see the final film. So sometimes hundreds of hours of material are, are cut out when you see the final film, but what happens in the process of this elimination? And how can you resurrect the, the, the footage that has been eliminated? And also how, um, how and what do you gain when you look at the archive of a filmmaker? Well, on and as I said before, Savvy Contemporary is interested in processes towards unlearning and decanonizing and exploring multiplicities of narratives and modes of knowledge production. And we are also, um, in that context, film is a very important medium for us, um, especially for me and Laura, because we're also working on a research which is pertaining to distribution of, or distribution and exhibition of s cinema between global south regions. But, um, Film as a medium, um, when one sees it as an audience, um, it does not just or engage with one of your senses, it engages with two of your senses, sight and hearing. And through, through this, it also expands into your unconscious, subconscious. And sen since it has this ability, it, it also has um, the possibility to maybe um, um, mold how you think, how you see the world, and, and basically the person or the, the, the ones who have the power to create these images um, are, 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 have been, sorry. It's okay, Abhishek has managed to like set up this whole uh, live streaming and video and Along sound, so a round with Rana. F round of applause, by the way, for the live streaming that we have going on here. Um, <laughs> and so, yeah. So basically what we're interested in, and then I'll come to the exhibition that we have now, is looking at film as a means and as a mode of knowledge production and of finding different narratives. and. Um, for this edition of Forum Expanded, we have invited Brazilian indigenous filmmaker Patricia Ferreira Paraeschepi, who's sitting right next to me. A uh, round of applause. I think some of you have met her already in the tour, but yes, we're so happy you're here. <laughs> Maybe we can welcome her again. <laughs> and through this exhibition, we're interested in her, her, um, her take on the cinematic language and her form of narration through exhibiting her work here. Um, the exhibition is called Letters from a Guarani Woman in Search of the Land Without Evil and was curated by Brazilian filmmaker and visual artist Ana Azevedo, who is here to my right. Welcome, Ana, as well. <laughs> At the center of the exhibition, some of you have seen it just now, lies the concept of the Jiguata, the spiritual journey um, of embarking on walks in search of the land without evil, so transcending the imperfect world that is marked by atrocities and centuries of fights for the right of being. How does this journey become a narrative of, this of its own? We have been working a lot in the last couple of months to understand how we can bring this journey and this mysticism in the form of an exhibition here to the space at Savi. Um, the exhibition follows itself a path, becomes a jiguatar, told in different letters using the medium of film uh, for uh, communication. Um, Patricia says in letter three of the show that you just saw, I use the camera to provoke the indigenous and the non-indigenous. But as you move through the exhibition, you will encounter many modes of storytelling actually that go beyond the cinematic. The weaving works of her mother Elsa, for example, tell stories through creating an incredible ab abstraction. So how many different weapons does it take for a fight? Welcome all to the invocation session around this exhibition. Um, we invite
invite you to join us for a day of talks, performances, music, um, to contemplate the ideas and concepts echoing Patricia's exhibition, thinking about indigenous storytelling and media as a form of narration, but also protest and documentation. Tracing the historical entanglements of power relations of mu and mu moving image used in visual anthropology, we spark the discussion on fiction, representation, and futures in take one today, the first panel. Uh, going over to struggles for land rights and cinematic documentation in take two. And then finally, we will explore the concept of indigeneity and the possibilities of coalitions and commonalities empowering film circulation. This will be tonight. Okay, that was a long introduction. Um, I just want to say we're standing here, the four of us, but um, this exhibition to me for sure has been a lesson in coalitions across the Atlantic, but also in the collectivity of our practice at SAVI. Um, when I say m I, what I actually mean is we, because um, in this project, we is also Irene Fontidaki, who's the co-curator and project manager, um, Elena Quintarelli, my partner in crime, who is at home now and almost giving birth to a baby, Temba Bebe, who's sitting here in the second row and has definitely been instrumental to shaping this program, Wilson Mungai, who did the art handling and built the cinematography, Lily Simoji, who did the design, Anna Yega, who did the communication, and all the rest of the Savvy team who have been really instrumental in pulling this exhibition together last week. Okay, that's it from my side. Um, I just want to say maybe one more word. Thank you to Goethe Institut Rio de Janeiro, IFA, um, Institute for Auslandsbeziehung, and the Embassy of Chile, who are supporting us with the Spanish translation today. Okay. Should we begin? Yeah. Next one. Um, so for that, I would like to invite... Um no, wait. Now we give the word to Anna. Oh. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Thanks, everyone, for coming. Hello. Thank you very much for coming. It's really a pleasure to be here. I'm um, proud and happiness with this exhibition. And... And also because uh, I met here in Savi a very nice team. And I think nowadays I can call them my friends too. And I'd like to read a text because this, this exhibition, we in our exhibition we have 12 letters. And, and I also would like to, to introduce a new letter in this exhibition. And I will read this new letter for you. Just a second. <coughs> First of all, because when I received this invitation to create this exhibition, Bonaventure, um, he told me, you are free to, to talk about Brazil and invite uh, an artist. So I told him, okay. I accept, but only if I can invite a female indigenous filmmaker. And sh uh, he told me, okay, let's go ahead. And that's the reason Patricia is now here. And also because uh, that's also the reason I wrote this letter, because it has to do with, uh, with uh, this, this, this this gesture to call an indigenous filmmaker to be here today. So, if you are going to talk about Brazil, we need to hear those who received the first impact of the European invasion in America. I'm talking about five centuries of resistance. Five centuries are not five years. This exhibition reads you like letters, 12 letters. Each work has a message a story that Patricia Ferreira is telling to non-indigenous people. The title of this exhibition is a reference to the most powerful myth in Guarani culture, the search of the land without <coughs> evil, a, ki a kind of earthly paradise. However, the 12 letters written to non-indigenous uh, world also qu carry a silent Thirtieth letter. This letter emanates from all 12 cards together. It's a um, whispered letter that talks about my country, Brazil. 
the urgent message from the Guarani people reflects many other urgent messages sent from all over the country. Today, the struggle has been unified. We are all in the same rusty ship, full of holes and seeking quickly. Concerning this exhibition, these invocations, concerning this exhibition, this invocation, here I come to the most difficult part to talk about because I cannot find words neither in Portuguese or in English. Words uh, capable of speaking surgically about the monstrosity that has taken over Brazil. Um, I, who always read and wrote a lot, me, who thought I had the Portuguese lexical inside me, I, who thought would always find perfect words for all situations in life. In 2016, with the coup d'etat in Brazil, the illegal impeachment of the President of the Republic, Dilma Rousseff, the roads began to fail. What happened in 2016 was a coup d'etat built by the most abomin abominable forces in the country, motivated by the he hatred for the popular classes, by the even greater hatred, 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 hatred for the popular class that were finally experiencing a little so social accession, as accession. Poor young people going to universities, families being able to travel on vacation, for example, and also a coup d'etat built by a strong misogyny. If Dilma Rousseff is a man, the coup d'etat would not have happened. In January 2019, when part of the population decided not to vote, we uh, washing their hands concerning the future of a nation larger than Europe, than Europe. In January 2019, when another part of Brazilians decided to vote for a man totally inadequate to be in charge of the country. So I realized that in my dictionary, the proper roads were missing to be used in contests of perversity. That's it. The current Brazilian government is perverse. It is based on a network of criminal interests. And it was then that we realized who we were, in fact, we Brazilian society. No, we are not the coolest people in the world. It was not easy. And until, until nowadays, it's not easy to face the mirror. The news that it crosses the Atlantic is only a small part of the horror in which we live under a fascist government on all levels, social, economic, moral. In one year, in one year the disman dismantling of the country is enough to take us back, back to the timing of the caves. When a president does not stop to offend indigenous black people, Brazilians live in the north and northwest of the country, Japanese, we are returned to the caves. When the president disrespects women on a daily basis, when he encourage, encourages sex tourism, we are back in the caves. When the, <laughs> when the Minister for Foreign Affairs says that the Holocaust did not exist and the Nazism is a socialist practice, when those responsible for science believe that the earth is flat, when the Secretary of Culture makes a statement to the nation imitating gesture and repeating Joseph Goebbels' words, when the country door is open for pesticides banned worldwide, when guns become the new national symbol, when the humanities are erased from school curriculum, when universities are pursued and lose much of few resources they have, when the students are encouraged to pursue, to pursue their teachers 
to film their class and denouncing them as communists. When boys must uh, wear blue and girls wear pink. When people uh, with uh, uh, HIV are considered by the president as an expense for the country. When this guy in charge of a democratic country send a WhatsApp message from his private mobile calling the population to go on the streets in two weeks and support him uh, horrible attitudes. When this and so many other unthinkable situations for the 20th century, 21st century become part of our daily lives, we are back in caves, back in the caves. The news that reaches in, here in Europe about the horrors of this fascist government, they are only a small part of what we have facing daily. Today, Brazil is a country in ruins, and we are becoming sick. The name of our illness is Brazil. The arts are the enemy number one. Fascists dressed in green and yellow hate artists. The cinema is under an aggressive boycott. The Brazilian film industry employs more professionals than in the pharmaceutical industry. When I first came to Germany in the 90s, and for a long time it was difficult to, to understand why German friends seems don't like the, their country. Do not wear the uh, national colors, do not wear the football team t-shirt, although to like soccer. For Brazilians who always loved going out on the streets uh, wearing the green and yellow shirt of the Brazilian flag, Germans' attitude so many years after the end of the Second War did not make sense for me. The Brazilian extreme right assaulted the country and at the moment is taking national symbols hostage. The image of the green and yellow crowd invading the streets stealing violence against President Dilma Rousseff in 2016 and calling Bolsonaro myth in 2019 and calling for the militaries again is a nightmare that will not abandon us anytime soon. Today, for most Brazilians, it's easy to understand the process that led to Hitler's rise in power in Germany, as well as the consequent aversion to national symbols. I don't know when I will make peace again with green and yellow. Maybe never again. We never, we never stop to think, to reflect on our colonial heritage and on our 20 years under an assassin dictatorship. So discreetly fed off the main, sta of the main stage, both have been re uh, resisting strongly and through us back to a distant past. And here we are searching for our land without evil again. Thank you very much. I will hand the mic over to Patricia if you want to say hi. <laughs> Sorry, my Spanish is so bad. <laughs> Oi. Aguijevete. Enjo está aqui sem entender. Dá para falar o que não é que não é? Dá um oi, dá um oi lá que é só. Dá um oi, só. Tá. É, agradeço muito a presença de vocês né, aqui. Thank you very e, much for coming. Estou uh, tô, tô feliz né, com, com a presença de vocês, que a nossa ideia né, com essa exposição também é isso, é alcançar as pessoas né, que não conheciam nós, né, é nesse momento sombrio também que a gente passa no Brasil. Então, agradeço a presença de vocês. Uh, thank, uh, thank you very much for coming. And 
um, the reason of this uh, exhibition is not only uh, talk about uh, about the uh, Guarani culture, but also uh, try to send uh, here to Berlin um, information about uh, this uh, horrible moment we are facing in Brazil. So, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much for being here, and I'm going to pass the mic over to Abby now. Okay. So now we begin the Act One of of the Invocations, which would be a loose conversation and a look into works of. And I'm going to welcome them to the stage. Um, Laura Huerta Millian, um, Edna Bonhomme, and Claudia Coimilia. <laughs> uh, please join hands to welcome them to the stage. Well, having grown up a millennial in India, I experienced the swift and ruthless onslaught of media culture post the neoliberalization of our country in the 90s. MTV, HBO, National Geographic told us what was cool at that point. We were hungry for entertainment and we gulped down everything without any filters. We imbibed the ideology that, that were packed in these glossy images. We agreed. When the advert on TV told us that Tanda Matlab Coca-Cola, which translates to the one which is cold, is Coca-Cola, we forgot the taste of cool water from a mud pot and gulped down one Coca-Cola or Pepsi or whatever sugar soda drink our favorite cricketer um, endorsed. We gulped down the ideologies. We also gulped down the ideologies like fair skin is a prerequisite to success. Love has to be pursued even when you have rejections. Uh, watch some Bollywood movies if you want to get that reference. Um, and of course, the slow but steady othering of Muslims, women, queers, Adivasis, which are indigenous inhabitants of India, and the already marginalized communities. I, and of course, the poor. I believe that the current situation in India um, is, is as much a political doing as much it is an erasure of history, discrimination and representation, and the loss of future for the, l for the ones who are othered. One of the world's biggest film industries, Bollywood, doesn't seem to find characters and protagonists that represent the marginalized stories, and when, when then, only in a convoluted sense. I wonder how do my fellow millennials coming from different parts of the world here see this in their context? And I'm glad to be joined by artist and filmmaker Laura Huerta Millian, uh, researcher, filmmaker, and podcast creator and writer Edna Bonhomme, and a Mapuche filmmaker um, Claudia Quimila. How <laughs> Um so I would just uh, just pass on the the mic and the computer to Laura. Thank you. Hello. I will just um, start by thanking you for this invitation and thanking Laura and all the Savi team. I'm very honored to be here with you today and to be able to share my work with you. I was planning um, on perhaps showing some excerpt from one of my films, which is part of a series around the idea of exoticism, 
One thing that maybe should be said is that um, I am Colombian and French. I've been living in France for 20 years now. And basically I spent half of my life in Colombia and half of my life in France in between the two countries because all of my family still lives in Colombia. So this has informed a lot my work and I started to be a filmmaker actually working on that in betweenness and how I perceive the frictions and these misencounters between uh, Europe and the Americas. So uh, I'd rather start by working, uh, showing a little bit of the work and then perhaps if you um, I would like to read a text around this series on exoticism and yeah so it's since it's a, like a filmmaking work uh, I will really like to have the light shut down if that is possible and I'm going to sh uh, show an excerpt three minutes excerpt of a film called journey to a land otherwise known just the beginning of the film Yeah, thanks for your patience. It's really better to be in total darkness to see, to have a sense of the film. No? We'll try like this, or, okay.
I'm going to stop here because just to, to get you a sense of the film. So all the film is filmed um, in a tropical greenhouse in France, in the city of Lille, um, which is in the north of France. And I would like to read the text, maybe because um, so it will be perhaps more clear about the foundation of this work. So, in 2009, I began a series of films on the notion of exoticism, looking critically at representations of otherness and the political fictions surrounding alterity was a way for me to make sense of an existential crisis that I was going through at that time. I was positioned between two countries with a multicultural mestizaje and experiencing racialization as a lower middle class Colombian immigrant in France. These films led me to consider the complex relationship between Europe and the Americas and the continued life of colonial representation and political structures today. I started looking more specifically at documents that testify the intrinsic relationship between imperialism and ethnography. For example, the images of human zoos from between the 1890s and 1940s, called at the time ethnological or, or anthropological exhibitions, in which men, women, and children from Africa, Asia, Oceania, and the Americas were made objects of exotic spectacle in a number of parks in Europe. These images haunted me. I could see recurrent formal devices in them. People looking straight into the camera in direct confrontation. The, abs the absence of de development of individual characters, the objecti objectification of the collective as an undivided foreign body, the grotesque, the grotesque exoticism of the mise-en-scene. I let later recognize many, many of those same formal tropes in both historical and contemporary ethnographic mu uh, documents and museums too. The fact that today many of the sites of human zoos in Europe don't show any kind of acknowledgement of this history is revolting. Many of those places, such as the Garden of Tropical Agronomy in Paris, the Jardin Tropical de la Ville de Paris, are still designed to attract the public with the vestiges of a grandiose or so-called grandiose colonial past. So my first narrative films were guided by ne the necessity of connecting gardens that evoke an exotic tropical elsewhere with the actual archives of colonial history and indigenous genocide. So this film, Journey to a Land Otherwise Known, associates the equatorial greenhouse in Lille, France, with fragments of well-known text by conquistadors and missionaries who first described the erroneously named New World to European audiences and contributed to a racist imaginary which is still present in our societies today. So when I did this film, just uh, as a side note, um, Nicolas Sarkozy was president of France and one of his programs was to create the ministry of national identity. And every morning, uh, one would wake up with radio stations where politicians were like again and again, um, you know, stigmatizing foreigners as being uh, guilty of all the problems that France could face. And I think that also um, made me, uh, created the necessity to come back to those archives of the colonial history and bring back to a uh, place from the present. And in the film, I use text made by uh, travelers who were Spanish, um, but also travelers from France. Actually, the person who named the Amazon River was a French scientist, Charles de la Condamine, so they were implicated into that process, and travelers from Portugal and the Netherlands. So, Analyzing these accounts and ethnographical documents 
left me with a paradoxical conclusion. On the one hand, if one considers ethnography as an ensemble of narratives rooted in colonialism, it could be understood as a kind of fiction making. On the other hand, some of the most interesting contemporary practices of ethnography today have embraced the decolonial turn, sometimes by integrating the language of fiction into themselves. So the term ethnographic fiction seemed um, appropriate to describe this duality. And as I'm thinking about anthropologists that maybe you've heard about, like Eduardo Viveiros de Castro, who works in Brazil, who actually one of his um, most well-known uh, books, which is Cannibal Metaphysic, is built upon the fiction of a book that he will never write. So he's already integrating fiction in order to decolonize his own field. And he actually, de he actually describes ethnography af as a constant operation of decolonizing thought. So it's been in interesting for me to look to anthropologists and ethnographers working on the global south that are actually into the field and bringing this element in order to change the perspectives. And associating the words ethnography and fiction immediately pushed my research into the field of visual anthropology in the tradition of what Jean Rouge called ethnofictions. And although Rouge's work was extremely important for me, uh, the, the idea of a cine trans and the idea of a shared anthropology, I didn't want to limit my research to his legacy. On the contrary, I did a, uh, I did a practice based PhD on this idea of ethnographic fiction, trying to look at practices that linked fiction and ethnography before and after him, and coming from different perspectives outside of Europe and North America, and also from women and non-binary voices, which are voices that I feel are um, lacking a lot in European anthropology academias. So, yes, that's what I wanted to say, I think, around this, um, these ethnographic fictions. And I, um, I am still um, working today with this inspiration or this amateur, I would say, look upon ethnography. Perhaps also thinking about um, something that Viveros de Castro also talks about, the fact that ethnography today is also a reflection on language itself. And what can bring ethnography today? I think it can bring this possibility of creating new forms of language and related to um, trying to build communities in places where there's a lot of division. And it is still a place, I would say, ethnography can still be a place to think about what means to be together. And we don't necessarily have to be exactly all the same. But this difference and this cultural friction can also be an element of togetherness. Um, I don't know if I have the time to talk about one more project, perhaps? <laughs> okay. I'll just show an image, so an, and not an excerpt. Just to give a sense of where the research came, because I did this series around exoticism, and then it, this was the ground to do a series of ethnographic fictions, and I and I actually did this practice-based PhD. I'm g just going to show an image because I don't think we have time for an excerpt. Um, I did a series on ethnographic fictions and um, this practice-based PhD was developed between uh, two universities in Colombia. And I had the chance to be part of uh, an experimental laboratory, ethno laboratory of ethnography called the Sensory Ethnography Lab. And I was very interested about the fact that uh, anthropology still to date and to go to the most uh, exotic or, or the most far away places. And I wonder what would happen if I tried to go to the, mo the closest, the, in the most intimate. And so I decided to do a film uh, related to my own family in Colombia, which is um, with some persons of my family, which I didn't have a strong link for a very long time, which are my mother and one other uh, woman of my family. And I decided to do this film um, integrating again the sort of um, anthropological, I would say, approach and fictional. 
And I would say that anthropology helped me precisely for this project because it was a project made around the, um, the notion of mental illness because in my family, many women of my family, uh, my mother and many close uh, relatives are um, suffering from this. And so, and I realized that going into France was also related for me as a way to perhaps escape this fate that was um, way uh, a weight on the women of the family. And so I decided to do this film around this um, character called Antonia, who is um, performed by my own aunt, and the character is created rela uh, mixing um, some parts of her own story that we replay the three of us, my aunt, my mother, and I, in the present. Um, so maybe I'll stop here because it was for me important to show the trajectory between this exoticism series to a form of autoethnography that was part, let's say, of, of uh, this, uh, this project. <coughs> Um, so first of all, I wanted to thank uh, the caregivers, uh, the cleaners, um, and people who helped to make it possible for everyone to be here. Uh, and I wanted to kind of continue on the note of like auto ethnography as well as like what does it mean to look at uh, personal history in order to think about my practice as a researcher, but also as someone who's doing a lot of unlearning about the place that I was born in and the place that my parents were born in. Um, first of all, I am a descendant of slaves and particularly slaves that ended up in Cuba and Haiti. And my parents migrated to the United States uh, shortly before I was born uh, because of a dictatorship that was being funded by the United States. And what that meant was that I uh, had to, similar to you, go back and forth between two different worlds, one in which uh, I had to think about myself as an American and the ways in which a U.S. settler colonial state uh, positions itself, uh, demonizing Haitians, as, and then trying to overcome that somehow. So I wanted to begin in some ways with a fiction, and a fiction that is tied to an event from 10 years ago. Pat, this is a this is a, a, a calamity of, of cataclysmic proportions. I'm sure it's the worst thing that's happened uh, since the tsunami, and um, it, it's just uh, it's a it's a mess. Pat. Well, if all those buildings have been, I understand more have fallen than they're standing. Uh, it may be a, a blessing in disguise. Something it might be a massive rebuilding of that country. Is that possible? Well, I don't know. I would think that uh, that would be uh, a pretty optimistic uh, attitude. Christy, something happened a long time ago in Haiti, and uh, people might not want to talk about it. They were under the heel of the French. Uh, you know, Napoleon the Third or whatever. And they got together and swore a pact to the devil. They said, we will serve you if you will get us free from the French. And so the devil said, okay, it's a deal. And uh, they kicked the French out of, you know, the Haitian revolt even got themselves free. But ever since, they have been cursed by, by one thing after the other, desperately poor. That island of Hispanoa is one island. Mm -hmm. It's cut down the middle. On the one side is Haiti, on the other side is the Dominican Republic. The Dominican Republic is, is prosperous, mm -hmm. healthy, all of resorts, etc. Haiti is in desperate poverty. Same island. Uh, they need to have, and we need to pray for them, a great turning to God. And out of this tragedy, I'm optimistic something good may come. So, a counterpoint to this? Little statement last night the meeting said we had a, a contract. My parents had a contract with the devil. That's why we 
the bread, uh, this kind of stuff. I want to start to go back, go back to the history. Haiti, my parents came to Haiti, they brought from Africa and spent 300 days of slavery. And finally, they decided to say, enough is enough. They stop and they go back to the They set the way for everybody to be free. They do not believe because of the color of the skin that should be slave of somebody else. If you say you are a man of God, you have got to believe that. So part of why I thought it was important to show this is because this is the 10 year anniversary of the Haitian earthquake which happened on the 12th of January 2010 and uh, most of Haiti is still, or most of Port-au-Prince, uh, the capital city uh, is still uh, in rubble. About 1 million people are still internally displaced within that city and many others have fled to neighboring countries including the United States. Part of why this is important to point out is because uh, in 2016 the 45th uh, dictator in the White House pointed out that Haiti is a shithole country and many of these scapegoating um, stereotypes persist today. It's not just the United States, it actually happens, uh, these perceptions happen beyond and uh, it's important to know uh, for me, what, the ways to overcome that is through discourses around Afrofuturism, discourses around uh, new narratives, and discourses around unlearning many of the traumas uh, and the uh, uh, alternative facts, as they call it, of, that is being purported by the US. Um, and one quote that I want to turn to is by uh, Tasha Wamak from Afrofuturism, which states, it's one thing when black people aren't discussed in world history. Fortunately, teams of dedicated historians and culture advocates have chipped away at the propaganda, often functioning as history for the world's students to eradicate that glaring error. But even in the imaginary future, a space where the mind can stretch beyond the Milky Way to envision routine space, travel, cuddly space animals, talking apes, and time machines, people can't fathom a person of non-European descent a hundred years into the future. A cosmic foot has to be put down. And it's in this way that I think looking at actual facts and history gives us an entry point into thinking about why and how we can challenge some of the stereotypes uh, that are often put towards Haiti. One uh, entry point is Adrian uh, Rich, who says, the truth of our bodies and our minds has been mystified to us. We have a primary obligation to each other not to undermine the other's sense of reality for the sake of expediency, not to gaslight each other. And so it's in this realm that thinking about what that, um, with uh, Hans had said, we have to look at the migration of of people from the African continent and what that looked like. People know the figures, 12 million, but they often don't get a visual sense of what that, that looked like in actual terms. So what this particular graph shows, um, and you'll start to see more dots moving across from uh, the continent and different parts from what is now uh, Senegal to what is now Angola, going to Brazil, uh, the Caribbean, the United States. In fact, only a small fraction of the people who were stolen were brought to the United States. Uh, most of them uh, were brought to the Caribbean and the other parts of the Americas as a way to um, have free labor and fuel the capitalistic interest of Europeans as, as most of you have known. Uh, and what we can gather from this and what we can hope to uh, do to repair this very damaging history, especially a history that was destructive to indigenous people is to also point to how and who help to theorize and create a framework for decolonizing and challenging these systems. For me, Ami Césaire uh, is a particularly important figure who uh, very much tried to pinpoint the French colonial project and to say that um, colonization works to de-civilize the colonizer, to brutalize him in true sense of the word, to degrade him, to awaken to the buried instincts to covetedness, violence, race hatred, and moral relativism. And this moral relativism is very much present in uh, the likes of white Christian fundamentalist Pat Robinson, who makes a claim that somehow Haiti's liberation or Haiti's poverty, um, as a matter of fact, is attributed somehow to uh, claims about the devil. And what 
we can then use then to understand or to think about Ami Césaire, who's a black Martinican, also part of the French Imperial Project, is to also look back into the, what he's speaking of when he speaks about colonization. He's speaking about um, Saint-Domingue, which was uh, Arawak land before it became um, known as the island of Hispaniola. Uh, he's speaking about the enslaved subjects who had to work under harsh conditions. Um, but what Hans, uh, the Haitian uh, person who uh, counteracted uh, Pat Robinson wanted to point to is a revolution that tried to do, uh, undo that uh, colonial project. Um, and that colonial project was tied to uh, African slaves, enslaved people overthrowing an empire, um, and also people who were um, d uh, the children of African slaves and white European French people who also revolted against that regime. One of the things that I, in my practice, have tried to do or un unlearn is the demonization and scapegoating of Haiti uh, of voodoo. Uh, voodoo is a thing that he was referring to, and it's a ritual that is commonly under un under uh, um, not fully understood by people, especially as it's depicted in mainstream media, films, etc. So one of the things that I, in my kind of uh, practice of discovering my family's lineage since I did not necessarily get exposed to voodoo as a child or in my upbringing is to ask myself what is voodoo and that meant doing the work of figuring out the symbols that are associated and the different types of spirits that are tied to this epistemology. Uh, for people who practice, it is very much tied to the Rada and Pedro, so Rada being some of the good Luas, like uh, Freda, um, Elsa Freda, and the um, Rada being those spirits, uh, the uh, Pedro being spirits that might be considered evil or at least have a bit more autonomy within uh, certain resistance and forces. For people who study the Haitian Revolution, um, Bukman is one of the many figures who is both anti-colonial and also tied to voodoo. And it very much contributed to uh, the continuation or the perennial uh, uh, state of people uh, seeing voodoo as a form of anti-colonial resistance. In order for um, me to also think about who and what, when, when was voodoo being documented, I tried to think about uh, some of the ethnographic practices like, that were happening in the early to mid 20th century, which I'm actually quite critical of, especially if the, those people are coming from North America, to how then people who practice voodoo today are seeing themselves. So one particular ethnographic um, piece is this here, which is by Maya Duran, which is the Divine Horseman. So this particular um, film is interesting because it does provide a kind of historical timestamp of a particular set of group of people who are practicing in Haiti, but it, it doesn't necessarily represent uh, uh, all of the ways in which people practice. The reason that I'm somewhat critical of it is, well, A, how did she get access as a North American person? B, to what extent um, does the gaze and the, the representation of this group of people, is it something in which she was um, in uh, respecting or honoring the practice in its full sense? Um, at the same time, it is an archival document that could be used to then compare, um, and I'll show you some images later, of what voodoo looks like today. I think one thing to also note is the loi or the spirits um, are very much centered around inscription. They're centered around symbols that can uh, very much attract uh, the spirit to come vis-a-vis -vis the uh, practice. And beyond that, uh, there are various uh, lois or forms of resistance by um, within voodoo that can point to questions around um, love and homosexuality. For example, uh, El Zulidanto, which is the uh, one of the Radas, uh, is a spirit that's about love, but she's also tied to lesbianism, women's independence, um, and is just a patron for so many uh, people who uh, want to tear down the patriarchy. And so it took, for me, this, this uh, representation, especially in the um, 18th uh, century context, was, I can imagine, quite important uh, for 
African slave, enslaved women who wanted to challenge how uh, the system that was making their bodies both a vesicle of reproducing the next generation of slaves as well as uh, people who had been displaced from the land that they had come from. And in order to kind of get a sense of what Urzuli repre uh, represents uh, to people who live in Haiti today vis-a-vis -vis music, I want to play a song that um, invokes her spirit. So as the song continues to play in the background, I want to give you a context. It's a 19th century folk uh, poem uh, that was written by Canto, a Haitian uh, person. And part of what they're uh, chanting is to kind of provide some kind of uh, sacrifice to Erzuli. Um, and that includes ananas, uh, which is pineapples, cigarettes, cigarettes, and other things. Uh, what I find interesting about this particular piece, as well as when uh, the couple times as an adult that I've seen uh, voodoo ceremonies is that it is a communal act. Um, singing is not a, always a solitary thing and there's a way in which a call might be made by an individual at first but then it in evokes the community to participate. And it's in this respect that um, what is uh, practicing voodoo for me is a revolutionary act and it is an act that is being um, kind of imagined in the post-earthquake uh, situation in Haiti. Um, and in order to kind of think about that I will play briefly um, an excerpt from a documentary focusing on the priestess Mando, uh, who is building community in a post-earthquake Haiti vis-a-vis uh, uh, -vis, uh, voodooism. <laughs> So one thing I'll point out is um, I was in Haiti in 2010, um, several months after the earthquake, but I was also in Haiti before the earthquake had happened. And uh, part of what was difficult uh, for me as part of the diaspora is that there was a hierarchy of life constructed whereby if one was a white European, white American person working for an NGO, you had access to housing, um, maybe a car, um, clean water, etc. And for those of us who look like me, dark skinned, black, etc., uh, in many cases people were not afforded those opportunities. Um, and then beyond that, and I was uh, 
in Haiti at the time that the cholera epidemic started and continued. Uh, there was also this epidemic that was then raging uh, against people. So their communities, uh, like the one that is um, formed by Mambo Kati, uh, they've tried to, as best as possible, to work in the conditions and that has vilified them on the one hand, but also that has made them on the bottom rung of society within their own country. Uh, beyond that, uh, these um, for the, for people like Kati, as is indicated from this uh, clip. Uh, voodoo is a way for them to feel liberated. It's a way for them to feel connected. It's a healing practice. It is, is something that is part of uh, and a continuation of a revolution that was started in the 18th century. Uh, another element of voodoo that's important is the, the ceremony. So in this particular ceremony, uh, the dead are constantly being um, uh, evoked. The dead are being uh, uh, honored and wearing whites and, and showing that sense of uh, communal uh, spirit within the, the, the dress and having drums, etc., is part of that process. So all of taking this all together, um, I, I kind of want to end then on my practice and what it how this uh, voodoo ritualistic care and even just evoking history is very important for thinking about ideas around Afrofuturism, ideas around the archives. Um, and, and this matters because um, for when I think about the context of my family, uh, there is, are very few documents that can actually point to where they're actually from in the, uh, on the African continent. Uh, my, my grandparents didn't even have a birth certificate, so my parents were the first generation, once they migrated to US, to have some kind of documentation. So in this respect, um, I think in many ways Afrofuturism allows us the uh, uh, step to think about imagination, the use of technology and other things to be able to undo that historical damage. And it's not just uh, cyborgs and Wakanda, as, um, and I love uh, the Black Panther movie and what it evokes, but it's, it's actually beyond that. It's about, um, in the Haitian context, protesting. So in the uh, January of this year, people were protesting in Port-au-Prince uh, despite having their displacement. Or it's in, in some cases the diaspora um, creating our own narratives and going back and trying to document our spaces. So this particular novel that just came out, Dear Haiti, Love Alain, um, is a, co uh, a novel co-written by two Haitian American sisters who do that work of trying to understand that identity. And beyond that, for me, it's also about creating um, a art and particularly uh, thinking about gender embodiment and displacement through collective work. So this is one particular um, art project that I, um, or art exhibition, not just a project, that I did with two of my collaborators here in Europe where we looked at um, gender surveillance and embodiment. And what came out from that was also similar to you, the um, sense of creating my own archives through herbs and by um, talking to and speaking with uh, my aunts and other people who, in my family, the women, to f understand and get a sense of what, how we um, heal ourselves. So in this particular short kind of piece, it's um, myself, it's the voice that you can hear in the background speaking to my aunt, asking her about the various plants that she keeps in her backyard, what they're used for, um, how they help to heal, um, and, and just getting that um, everyday human knowledge from the people that helped to raise me in a, a very communal space. Um, finally, I want to also think about, because I live in Europe at the moment, for now, until they kick me out, I guess, um, is thinking about um, cartographies of care, and specifically, this is related to an exhibition um, that I have here in Berlin right now. So what does it mean for black people like myself who come from the Caribbean, North America, the African continent, um, how do we heal in a place that doesn't necessarily want us to exist? <laughs> and how do we work through that through by being able to document our own narratives, our own stories, especially if, because those things could easily be erased vis-a-vis -vis the context of um, what 
the German state did uh, 70, 80 years ago. And so um, I'll end with a, a little bit of a clip from some of the uh, one person um, that I interviewed. I'm 34, born in 1980. I identify as a black woman. I am ethnically Jewish, and I practice Judaism. As a German black woman, it's not easy to answer because it's not something that I've chosen. Racialization processes, I think, are, are put on to people. It so happens that I identify as black and that I practice Judaism. I think I would be racially also classified as black and I'd be racially classified as somebody who is Jewish. So I would have been deported during that era because I'm black and also because I'm Jewish. So um, this is one of the many people that I interviewed alongside with my collaborator, where we try to vis-a-vis -vis our own archival pra practice as people, black people who are based here, uh, to use the soundscape, to use documentary evidence, to be able to tell, all, to tell our own stories and to show that our presence here does matter, uh, while also thinking about the politics of repair, the politics of care, as uh, an opportunity for us to create a more just future. So. Thank you. Buenas noches, eh, muchas gracias eh, por traerme, eh, por estar aquí, es un gran honor, estoy muy conmovida por estar con realizadoras con reflexiones tan potentes eh, y ser tan valientes de cuestionar la historia del discurso oficial, eh, me siento muy, muy orgullosa de poder compartir espacio con ustedes. Okay, so good evening, thank you very much, thank you very much for uh, for having bring, uh, brought me here. I'm very honored and moved to be here, uh, to be sharing uh, the space with women filmmakers who have such a powerful uh, discourse and who are so courageous as to uh, question uh, the, uh, the mainstream narrative in this way. Um, y es muy importante para mí eh, venir de tan lejos eh, y encontrarme con discursos y palabras de resistencia tan fuertes como las que nos hablaban de Brasil, en un momento en el que en Chile se está viviendo eh, un momento de mucha violencia, en donde han muerto decenas de compatriotas, miles de ellos han perdido sus ojos, eh, a causa de la violencia de la policía chilena por defender nuestros derechos. So it's very important uh, for me coming from so far away uh, to be here at listening to these discourses of, uh, of such strong resistance, uh, such as the one uh, from Brazil that, uh, that was shared with us. Uh, coming from Chile, myself, uh, we're living uh, in moments of very of great violence in which dozens of uh, Chileans have lost their lives and thousands of others have lost uh, an eye, their sight. Or, or an eye because of uh, on the, because of the police repression uh, against their claims for human rights. Um, por eso estos espacios son muy necesarios y estoy tomando fuerza también para volver eh, con la fuerza que ustedes también me dan a eh, continuar mi lucha en, en Chile. So these spaces are extremely necessary and what I'm, uh, right now I'm uh, recharging myself with strength thanks to the strength that, uh, that I'm feeling here so that when I go back, uh, when, uh, to go back and continue my struggle in Chile. Um, yo soy Mapuche, Mapuche significa gente de la tierra, 
es gente que ve a la tierra como su madre y por tanto la va a cuidar y la va a proteger de cualquier daño y básicamente eh, existen mapuches en todo el mundo pero tienen distintos nombres I am a mapuche mapuche means the people of the earth the people of the land so it's people who uh, treat the land as their mother will, t will take care of, of it and protect it so basically there are mapuches all over the world just with different names um, y um, me identifico mucho con lo que nos hablan las otras realizadoras de hablar del origen y tengo algo bien similar a, a Laura eh, que habla de que tiene eh, dos mundos que chocan eh, también me pasa a mí eso porque mi padre es mapuche y mi madre es chilena y siempre está este choque, este encuentro uh, so I identif <laughs> sí, dale, dale. I identify quite a lot with what the others have said, and uh, especially with what Laura said regarding uh, her, the origins and having different origins. Um, I have a similar experience in um, in the sense of uh, having two uh, colliding worlds, of coming from two colliding worlds. Uh, my father is Mapuche and my mother is uh, Chilean, so I've uh, lived through that clash all my life. Um, y les traigo una imagen, eh, soy yo a los seis años, es un día que representa el por qué me dedico al cine, por qué hago estas historias y ¿Sí? podemos apagar <laughs> la luz. Eso. Okay. And, uh, well, I, this image is me when I was six years old and it represents quite a lot of uh, why I do cinema, why I make cinema and why I tell stories. Uh, bueno, mis padres decidieron que no viviera en el campo, sino que viviera en la ciudad por la educación y este es mi primer día enfrentando el día de fiestas patrias, en donde ellos decidieron no enviarme con las vestimentas chilenas, sino con mi vestimenta mapuche. So, uh, my parents decided to raise me not in the countryside, but in the city, so this is the first day when I was in school uh, for the national holidays, um, in which my parents decided not to uh, not to send me in the uh, dressed up in the typical uh, folk uh, folk clothing but in my uh, traditional mapuche uh, clothing uh, y habían 600 niños todos con un traje y solo una mapuche so there were 600 children all dressed the same with the same clothes and just one mapuche y ese día me hicieron ir por todo el colegio <laughs> como si fuera un objeto de museo y tocando el cultrún que es un objeto de percusión eh, todo el día <laughs> and that day they they took me all around the school displaying me like if i was a museum artifact uh, showing me uh, and making me play the cultrún that's our um, a percussion instrument a drum uh, all day long uh, fue muy traumático para mí y me me cuestioné desde ese día el por qué yo era algo tan extraño para los chilenos um, y por qué me veían como un objeto de museo si eh, los mapuches estamos vivos hablamos como cualquier persona y estamos resistiendo hoy So that day, that was pretty traumatic. Traumatic. Uh, it made me question why do Chileans, why am I some, uh, such a strange uh, object or some, something so strange for Chileans, and why do they uh, see me as um, a museum object, whereas uh, I'm here, uh, we Mapuches, we're alive, uh, we speak our language, and we are resisting today. Um. Bueno, y en, los mapuches son conocidos porque es el único pueblo que el español no pudo dominar. Es un pueblo muy guerrero. Mapuches are well known because it was the only people that the Spanish could not dominate. It's a, a warrior, a people of warriors, a warrior um, mm -hmm. nation. Y la historia, el colegio para mí fue un campo de batalla porque la historia que me contaban mis profesores no coincidía con la historia que me contaban en mi hogar y momentos muy emblemáticos como eh, la pacificación de nuestro territorio eh, para mí en mi casa era conocido como la militarización de nuestro hogar y el momento en el que el estado chileno saqueó nuestras tierras y mató a nuestra gente y eso no es paz so uh, school for me um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, 
school for me was uh, was something very very uh, very hard. Um, all, all my all my my schooling, especially when I was seeing, especially through history, through uh, when I was confronted to to uh, the the main um, the the official history and the way it was told, it was this clash between what I was told in school and what I was told at home. For instance, um, the period that is taught as the pacification of our territories. At home, I was taught of it as the militarization of our territories, and uh, especially as the moment or as the period in which the Chilean state plundered our land. Oh, se hablaba del desastre de Curalaba cuando eh, debería ser el triunfo de Curalaba porque los que ganamos fuimos los mapuches, no el español. And they teach about the disaster of Curalaba Uh, whereas uh, I see it as the triumph, the victory of Curalaba, because it was the Mapuches and not the Spanish that won. Entonces, no entendía la historia de Chile, no entendía la historia oficial porque no era mi historia. So I couldn't understand this official Chilean history because that wasn't my history. Y, um, estos son los diarios del país que es la continuación de la historia y cómo, nos, cómo somos nosotros tratados los mapuches y ahí básicamente es de terroristas. And these are, um, these, this is the press from the country and it shows how still today mapuches are treated and for instance here as terrorists. Eh, o como violentos que atentan contra la patria, contra Chile, contra Argentina. Or as violent people who are attacking the um, the homeland, whether it's Argentina or Chile. Y por tanto siento que lo que hicieron es ver tanto en los libros de historia como en la prensa que los mapuches somos el enemigo interno al cual el chileno debe tenerle mucho susto y solo ir a ver al museo. And uh, so I feel that both uh, official history or, or history textbooks and the press, they, what they do is uh, describe us as the internal, the inner, the internal enemy that Chileans must be afraid of and only go to see uh, in, muse in the museum. Y en la televisión lo que ven los chilenos de manera gratuita, esta es la imagen con la que aparecemos que es una caricatura eh, de un indio que no eh, tiene mayor conocimiento, que es un ignorante, muchas veces es uraño, es flojo y además es borracho. Esa es la idea que se trabaja en los medios de, de comunicación. And um, on Chilean television, on public television, that is therefore um, uh, free, freely uh, viewed. Uh, this is the image. Uh, Mapuches are um, are displayed in this caricatural um, way, and always conveying these this idea of uh, ignorant, lazy drunkards. Um, and this is what the media uh, has constructed. Uh, y empecé a pensar que mi historia eh, no es solo mía, sino que hay muchos mapuches más que pueden haberla vivido y por eso comencé a estudiar eh, análisis de la UNICEF respecto a la infancia de los territorios mapuche y cómo se sienten y cómo se sienten discriminados por el color de su piel, de su pelo eh, y distintas razones. So I started thinking that certainly my history was that of many other Mapuches, that many people must have lived the same thing. And I started studying, uh, for instance, uh, UNICEF um, reports done on, uh, on Mapuche children, the perception of the ch of children about, how, uh, about the discrimination that they suffer because of their skin color, because of their origins and other reasons. Eh, aquí esta chica dice que eh, nos decían indios y luego cuando crecimos somos terroristas. So this girl is saying that um, when you're little they call you Indian and then when you're a teenager they call you terrorist. Y por tanto el ser mapuche se transforma en una vergüenza y es algo que tú quieres ocultar. Entonces en Chile, a pesar de que la gran mayoría viene de la cultura mapuche, muchos de ellos limpiaron sus nombres y se pusieron el nombre del cura porque nuestra cultura era diabólica. Entonces se pusieron el, adoptaron el apellido del cura del lugar. So, uh, this instills a sense of shame 
and people wanting to hide their Mapuche origins. And that's why even though um, many, uh, so many people have Mapuche origins, many have clear, uh, cleaned or cleared their names by changing them by changing their last name into uh, the name or the last name of the local priest because since our culture was diabolic, a priest had to give us uh, even, that, even the last name. Y en ese momento yo sentí que de algún modo yo tenía que aportar a reescribir esta historia por estos jóvenes eh, que eh, heredamos la vergüenza de nuestros abuelos que eran golpeados por hablar su idioma y que sintieron mucha vergüenza también de sus rasgos y de su de su conmovisión. So I felt that I had to contribute and help to rewrite our history for the, uh, these young people, for this youth that have inherited the shame felt by our grandparents who were beaten if they spoke their language and who had this, um, were discriminated or, or, or shameful about their, lo th the, their appearance and their features and their... Uh, Yes, and their cosmovision, of course. Um, y bueno, hay documentales mapuches, pero eh, no son muy vistos. Por tanto, yo sentí que eh, no era la prensa y la información lo que yo tenía que apuntar, sino más bien la emoción, y es por eso que llego al cine de ficción. Okay, so there are some, uh, oh, sorry, there are some mapuche uh, documentaries, but they, 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 they're not much, very much seen, they don't, um, they're not very much viewed, so I thought, okay, it's not through documentation and press and information that I have to do this, maybe I should aim at emotion, and that is how I, I decided to go on into uh, fiction filmmaking. Um, dejar de ver al mapuche como el enemigo. Mi padre me habló mucho de un cacique muy conocido mapuche que se llama Leftraru, él fue secuestrado por el español y vio cómo fueron asesinados sus hermanos, cómo fueron torturados y lo que hizo el Eftraru fue aprender las estrategias del español de lucha y sobre todo el uso del caballo eh, y mi padre me dijo que el caballo va tomando distintas formas dependiendo de la época en que vivas y que en esta época yo tenía que aprender a usar el caballo de hoy, la cámara, aprender del occidental y volver al pueblo y luchar ahora para contar nuestra historia. Okay, so, um, um, yes, yeah, so my father, uh, he would, he, he told me the story of, uh, of a leader, Leftraru, who, uh, was, who was kidnapped by the Spanish. Uh, he saw how they tortured and they killed um, his fellows and his, uh, his close ones. And what he decided to do was to learn, to learn Uh, the Spanish repression tools and the strategies, and for instance, he learned how to uh, use the horse, how to tame the horse. So my father said the horse is something that changes um, from time to, like, uh, according to times, and today's horse is the camera, so I should learn from this Western, uh, from the Westerners, I should learn to use this tool, uh, learn and go back and continue fighting that way. Um, y creamos esta película que se llamó Mala Junta o Mala Influencia y que pone al espectador en los pies de dos chicos que son catalogados así como alguien no deseado o la manzana podrida del, del cajón. Uno de ellos es Mapuche y es mi primo. So that's how um, I came to this film Mala Junta, that means sort of like the bad influence that's Uh, precisely putting us in, t in the shoes of these two boys that are both considered that way for different reasons, like the rotten apple of the group. Uh, one of them is Mapuche, and that is my uh, cousin. Estas son imágenes de la película. Eh, fue filmada en mi comunidad. So, uh, these are some images of the film that was filmed in my community. Uh, y fue muy importante poner la cámara dentro del hogar mapuche y no fuera como lo retrataban los medios. And it was really important to place the camera inside a mapuche home and not outside of it as the media does. Y hacer sentir al chileno lo que siente eh, un hogar mapuche. That way allow for the uh, Chileans to feel what people feel inside a mapuche home. Eh, bueno, actuaron todos mis vecinos, mi familia, sentían que era necesario que contáramos esta realidad. 
and all my neighbors and family uh, acted here, uh, acted in the film. They felt it was necessary to show this reality. Y esta es mi casa y aquí doy cuenta de lo que está pasando en nuestro territorio, no la postal que ven de Chile al exterior, sino más bien lo que está sucediendo en realidad, que es la deforestación de nuestro territorio. So this is uh, my home and this is uh, what I show. That's, this is not the, um, the, the postcard that's typically shown about my territory. The, what's really happening in, in, our, in my territory is this deforestation and destruction. Y aquí estamos recreando la muerte de un líder mapuche en la que se basó eh, esta película, la estamos recreando, pero al estreno de nuestra película murieron eh, dos dirigentes más en las mismas circunstancias. And so here we are uh, staging the death of a Mapuche leader that was killed uh, during that time, but by the time that the film uh, was released, two other Mapuche leaders were killed in similar circumstances. Y aquí estamos recreando lo que fue su funeral. Esto no puede ser filmado habitualmente, pero eh, lo hicimos porque sentimos necesario transmitir al chileno ese dolor que estábamos sintiendo y cómo estábamos perdiendo a nuestra gente. Um, so here uh, is the we create, we stage uh, the funeral. This normally this cannot be filmed, but we thought that it was necessary to do so to be able to convey and share with the Tillians the pain, um, the pain of, and, and the mourning when you're, when you're just losing your people. Y lo que hicimos es no seguir el modelo tradicional eh, para mostrar las películas y a quienes llevamos el cine, eh, lo enfocamos nuestra distribución en... Lo voy a bajar. Lo basamos en la distribución para los jóvenes, para los jóvenes de Chile, los herederos de esos abuelos que limpiaron sus apellidos, pero que tienen raíces mapuches, para que fueran al cine, muchos de ellos nunca habían ido, y se reconocieran en pantalla y no se sintieran solos por el bullying que han sufrido en sus vidas, eh, y disfrutaran también con eh, personajes de su edad eh, que son retratados de manera digna. And so uh, we didn't follow a typical exhibition, um, a traditional exhibition model. The, our dis distribution model was focused on, on young Chileans. We wanted to take this, we wanted to, to take this film to the young Chileans, often the um, grandchildren of those uh, people that had changed their last names out of shame, um, those who had always felt bullied because of their appearance. Some of them were were watching a film were in the cinema for the first time in their lives and the idea was for them to be able to identify, to feel less alone um, and feel a sense of dignity in the way they're portrayed. Uh, nuestro presidente, Sebastián Piñera, dijo un poco antes de esta gran rebelión popular que Chile era el oasis de Latinoamérica. Our president, Sebastián Piñera, uh, just uh, very, very uh, recently, or just, uh, just before this uprising that we are going through right now, he said something. He said that Chile was an oasis within Latin America. Y nosotros decimos que eran unos pocos los que estaban en ese oasis, y el resto de Chile, en realidad, éramos todos los que estuvieron en esa pantalla. Todos se sintieron mucho más identificados con estos dos chicos llamados mala junta o mala influencia, y que no tenemos un lugar al que al que pertenecer. But actually, uh, we think that in just a few people were in that oasis. All the rest, we felt that we uh, that we were much closer to what was displayed, what was shown on, um, on the screen, and I identified with those two boys that are seen as these rotten apples that don't belong anywhere. La película fue estrenada en Chile el 2016, eh, pero a partir de todo esto tuvo una segunda vida y esto fue hace muy pocos días. Eh, la película está siendo exhibida en distintos espacios de Chile al aire libre, distintos cabildos y encuentros ciudadanos. So the film was released in 2016, but now recently with uh, the current events, it's uh, having a second life. It's been, um, it's, it's being screened all over in uh, open air screenings, in um, citizen uh, meetings, and um, uh, it's, uh, yes, in, in citizen meetings, and then these um, cabildos that are. Mm -hmm. 
y mostrando a estos personajes que son los que Chile quiere ocultar, llevándolos a la calle y mostrándolos en lugares tan emblemáticos como en el centro de la capital. Oh, no, by the way, and th this was just a few days ago. So the idea is to take these characters that Tilly usually wants to hide and just take them uh, there on the street openly, um, show them to, um, openly publicly. Uh, a partir de eso también la película se volvió la película más vista en la plataforma de video on demand en Chile. And um, also, um, so, and so um, shown for instance in, right, in downtown Santiago, like in the previous image. And also there's this uh, open uh, video on demand um, platform of Chilean uh, films and it became the most seen film in there. Y es muy emocionante para mí esto que ha pasado. Uh, porque de ser un personaje extraño quiero mostrarles la imagen emblemática de las protestas hoy en Chile y la bandera que se alza ahí. So, and for me, it, what's been going on is very, very moving because um, we become from from being a, a, like this strange uh, character or this strange image. Now I'm going to show you what like the most emblematic image of this recent recent uprising has been. Ah, y la bandera que está ahí en la altura es la bandera mapuche. And that flag that's raised uh, up, up ahead is the Mapuche flag. Y lo que siento que hoy está en día sucediendo es que estamos cuestionando cuál era realmente el enemigo y estamos derrocando los símbolos que nos impusieron los colonizadores y estamos eh, intentando tener eh, reivindicar nuestra cultura y nuestros propios símbolos. So um, what's happening right now is that we're questioning who the real enemy finally was um, and also the colonial symbols that were imposed on us and um, now we are, we are revindicating these symbols. Y bueno, hoy en día eh, durante el toque de queda eh, y durante esta rebelión popular eh, nosotros filmamos una nueva película And um, during those days, the day, oh. <laughs> days in which there was curfew and of the popular uprising, uh, we started filming another film. Uh, sobre otros chicos que son catalogados estas manzanas podridas que son uh, los chicos de cárceles juveniles. About other, uh, of, about other kids, about other boys that are seen as rotten apples, that are those that in, in youth detention centers. Muchos de ellos son indígenas y mapuche. Many of whom are um, natives and specifically mapuche. No, no. <laughs> ah, eh, y esto es un caso real de 10 chicos que murieron dentro del centro, pero se han revelado las cifras de que han sido 1.313 los niños que han muerto a cargo de esta institución, a cargo del Estado de Chile. This is based on a real case of, um, of a fire in which 10 uh, boys were killed, but actually little by little the real figures have been revealed and we've learned that it's the amount of children that have died in the hands of, these, uh, of the Chilean state institutions is 1.313. Um, y mi lucha es, es esa, es darle voz a los que eh, Chile no quiere en su historia oficial. Um, so my struggle is to give voice to those people that Chile does not want to have in their official history. Uh, y para despedir, bueno, les dejo la imagen de mi equipo um, que, <laughs> que está haciendo el gesto de resistencia hoy en día eh, contra la violencia eh, policial. Um, and just to finish, here is a, a, a picture of the crew of the team and uh, the gesture that everyone is doing is what today has become the gest a gesture of resistance against police violence. Muchas gracias. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Laura, Edna, and Claudia, and of course Pamela, for for uh, sharing your views and uh, sharing your um, research and such beautiful um, visuals. Also, um, 
towards this panel and um, I would I would have um, one question for you um, because if for all of you all and you can choose to answer it and then we open it up for two questions to the public um, um, currently the research that I'm engaged in and uh, along with Laura is to do with how um, technology can can um, facilitate the the propagation and or um, repre representing oneself or one's idea uh, or one's identity in the right form and uh, technology has somehow enabled us in a way to produce our own content in, in uh, because cameras and uh, editing techniques got cheaper um, I would like to know how, how what what are your thoughts on the distribution or exhibition aspect of it how does it reach the people who you want to talk to and I, I, I was glad Claudia that you shared this image of uh, public screening of your films and um, well if you have any thoughts on that I would uh, like to hear and then we um, take some questions from the audience Whoever wants to go first. Um, you want to start? Um, okay. Yeah, so for me, it's a very interesting question, this question of technology and accessibility, because I don't come from a privileged uh, economical background. So when I was growing up in Colombia, I never had a video camera at home. And uh, going to the cinema was a sort of extraordinary event because uh, I was a good student or it was my birthday. So uh, I didn't become a cinephile until I was in my late 20s, actually. And all the access to cinema was through pirate DVDs, uh, in my 20s, downloading films. So I, so f I think that the access that I had for cinema has to do with this sort of piracy and counterculture, I would say. And another thing that took me a while to accept as well is that accepting that I was a filmmaker took me a decade because of this perhaps, and the fact that the Colombian industry has been growing a lot, and now you see many different practices inside and outside Colombia. Uh, but maybe when I was growing up, I had less access to what Colombian filmmakers were doing, actually. And uh, cinema, I still had this image of cinema of being something that came from Hollywood, or maybe European films that you could see uh, on television at 2 a.m. in the morning. So, um, yeah, so just accepting the fact that I could do cinema was took me a very long time, and I'm still working on that, actually. And I think as well that uh, if digital technologies would have not existed, I would not be a filmmaker today. Because I started doing cinema in art school with very tiny cameras and trying, uh, you know, and I think that I wanted to be an experimental filmmaker and I had the chance to, through fellowships, to go out of Colombia and study in France. And I wanted to be an experimental filmmaker, but all the access to what constitutes, um, in a classical sense, the experimental cinema, which is the analog technologies, was totally unaffordable for me. And in at school, um, they dismantled all the analog technologies, so we didn't have 16 millimeter cameras. And I tried twice, actually, to enter a lab in France, an independent lab of analog film, and I was rejected <laughs> twice. I don't know why. And uh, so it took me a very long time as well to decide what was to be uh, an experimental filmmaker and what was to be an independent filmmaker, not only on my terms, but only something, something that would not be completely related to a social class and related to the economics to go to cameras. And so uh, right now, I have been in this ethnographic fictions project, I have been working with, um, uh, with Cristobal Gomez, Gomez, who is uh, an indigenous man in Colombia. He lives in the Amazon. And we have done four films together. He's part of the Muinamurui com community. 
And it's been for me very interesting to see that when I'm working with him and his family, uh, some young, younger members of his family, the way that technology, how I, I am in the place of having the technology. And for a very long time, I saw myself as being in the place of not having access to that technology. And so one part of my work now is being thinking about how this reciprocity actually can be worked uh, in the collaboration that we have, not only in the terms of sharing, let's say, the narratives, but, only, but also act sharing these res other resources that are more related to technology. And so it's been part of, I would say, of the future projects that I'm trying to elaborate is through pedagogy related to how to share the, this uh, technical but also narrative knowledge that I've been um, assembling through the past 10 years of my life uh, as a filmmaker. And in terms of distribution, I think I'm still happy about, for me, it's a kind of achievement when I mean, this is streaming, so don't tell this to my distributors. <laughs> but I'm happy, actually, when my films get pirated because I feel like this is the... It's super... I feel very honored that people have the love for a film to cross the line of the law. But my producers uh, and distributors didn't hear me saying that. Uh, both my parents uh, came from Haiti and took a boat from Haiti to the United States and ended up in Miami. Florida, which is where I was born. And Miami is a funny place for various reasons <laughs> because it's a city that is still trying to figure itself out as a kind of new-ish place that had been settled in the late 19th century. Um, and it's technically, or not technically, it is on Seminole land. The Mississippi tribe and the Seminole people are originally from there. So those of us who, are, who found ourselves living in that space mostly came from Latin America and the Caribbean as a whole. And when my parents arrived as Haitian migrants in the 1980s, um, they were also people who were vilified by the US during the HIV AIDS epidemic and often blamed uh, for that epidemic and told that they were the ones carrying it when um, that was not the case. And because of that, the only jobs they could find was as a textile worker, janitor, cleaner, sanitation workers. So most of the family that I have that migrated, those are the kinds of positions they occupy. And this matters because it meant that I, till today, don't really see myself as a creative person and can't imagine myself as such because I was expected as the child of immigrants to basically get a, become a doctor and um, study hard and not necessarily um, follow other paths. However, um, because I'm my parents' child, I also uh, ended up going to a lot of protests and identified as a so socialist and was very much politically involved. And the, the pathway, I would say, to um, the creative production and to um, using technologies for creative production have been a bit circuitous, have involved using things that may not necessarily be neatly and formally tied to a fancy camera. In fact, um, when I do my recordings, I, can, I often use it, uh, the technology I do have, like my iPhone, or um, I use recorders um, that are borrowed, uh, or I, I, I collaborate with people. So the documentary for the current uh, exhibition that I um, have up, that's up, um, I worked with a Ghanaian Nigerian filmmaker and we went to the different sites together and um, it, it is a slow process for me and actually because of the lack of access because I'm, I'm coming from a working back uh, class background and at the same time um, I also would not like you want to create a kind of difference between high art low art whatever in fact if anything I grew up uh, in Miami watching telenovelas on Telemundo and you know like you know, all kinds of love triangles and everything to watching um, black-centered sitcoms like Living Single and Family Matters. And so my entry point to uh, what I consider to be entertainment isn't necessarily something that I see at a museum or a film festival or international film festival. It's the stuff that my family also um, wants to see. And then beyond that, and this is the thing that I, I guess I would end on, which is that as someone who grew up speaking Creole uh, in my home, and I still speak Creole with my family, my, with the friends who can understand it, and English, um, my parents, 
if I write an article, they're not gonna read it. In fact, they've never read, read anything that I've written. <laughs> if it, but if I produce something that is visually oriented, then they have an access, they have an entry point as people who didn't have, who didn't go to college, who didn't finish high school. Um, and as people that I love and respect, it's, it's my duty to be able to create an implant and some kind of creative process that they're able to see. And similar to you, I agree that things should be free, accessible to everyone. There should never be a paywall. And um, I, 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 yeah, the, it, I, w I think it's criminal when people have to pay exorbitant amounts of money and hyper-exploited uh, just to see the arts. Also, most of the money doesn't go to the artists anyways. Um, bueno, en, en Chile estudiar, eh, dicen que cuesta un ojo de la cara. Ese es el dicho hoy. Es mucho dinero y de hecho yo les cuento que el dinero que tuvimos para grabar mi pe primera película es el mismo monto que le debo al Estado por haber estudiado cine. Ok, so, um, en Chile, um, going to college is extremely expensive. And just to, um, just to exemplify that, the budget, the same amount of money of my first films of Mala Junta's budget is the same amount that I owe the Chilean state in, um, in, in my education credit loan, sorry. Um. Y en la universidad fue cuando por primera vez compartí con otra clase social muy alta. Los que deciden estudiar cine tienen generalmente mucho dinero. Eh, y yo digo que de hecho son aquellos que pertenecen a ese oasis del cual nos habla el presidente. Entonces eh, ellos sí contaban con cámaras, ellos sí hablaban inglés, ellos sí habían visto muchas películas, habían ido a Europa y mis profesores me hicieron ver que eso eh, no era lo importante, la mejor cámara, sino más bien las historias, la emoción, lo que uno quiere contar, la potencia de lo que uno quiere contar, y eso fue lo que me empoderó. So, it was in university where for the first time I was coexisting with uh, people from other social classes, because uh, mostly the people that decide to go to film school people with um, a, 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 from a higher um, economic socioeconomic background um, as I say as, as, I, as I see it they're one of the they're um, among the people that live in that oasis that are that are our president was talking about so they had the cameras they they spoke English they had been to Europe they had seen films uh, but my teachers uh, made me realize that it wasn't that that matter. It wasn't who had the best camera, but who had something to tell, uh, who had the most powerful stories and things to share, and that really empowered me. Uh, entonces, mi mejor aliado en ese momento fueron las cámaras digitales, eh, que democratizaron de hecho mucho el cine, pero también el internet, porque me permitió financiar a partir de un crowdfunding la primera película. So my my best <laughs> my best ally ally became uh, digital cameras, of course, uh, no, um, because they um, that because they brought uh, technology to everyone. They they democrat they made this more democratic, but also the internet because that allowed me to crowdfund my first fi my first feature film. Um, y cuando la película estuvo lista, eh, no teníamos tampoco dinero para grandes publicidades. Eh, y lo encontrábamos poco ecológico también el papel, así que nos dimos cuenta que el internet con muy poco dinero podíamos promocionar eh, muy bien la película en redes sociales, haciendo un contenido diferente a lo que se hacía tradicionalmente en la distribución de películas chilenas. And we didn't have a budget for advertising either, and we also considered that uh, the, the classic kind of advertising was not very environmentally friendly with all, uh, the, with all the paper that it uses. So we decided to use internet as an ally for our marketing strategy as well, and through uh, social networks and everything. And so we started creating um, different kinds of content, especially for that. Y pasó que eh, generalmente las películas llevan la mayor cantidad de espectadores al inicio y luego va decantando. Y con esta película, por las redes sociales, ocurrió todo lo contrario. Era como el boca a boca eh, de espectadores lo que nos hizo crecer. Eh, y contactarnos con ciudadanos que hasta el día de hoy nos piden la película para poder exhibirla en estos cabildos ciudadanos. Um, this also meant that 
typically uh, in the in, ex in film exhibition, it's right at the beginning, uh, the peak of spectators is right at the beginning, and then it starts um, to it starts to decrease. Uh, because of our um, strategy through social networks, it was the contrary. It started growing little by little through uh, word of mouth, and so um, it. The, uh, gains, get, gained visibility little by little, and until today, uh, there's citizens that still today contact us to uh, ask us for the film to be able to uh, to show it, to screen it in these uh, public situations. Maybe seven, and we get back here.
I'm very, it's a pleasure to be here again, and I would like to thank the matriarchal forces of Savi Contemporary for always creating this space for channeling all these struggles around the world and in a creative w way. That's how a way. And also, I'd like to thank Laura and Irene, especially for bringing us here. Um, we, ha um, we have um, three guests today Marinho Pina. Uh, Leo Pacarati and um, our, of course, main main hero of this um, exhibition and, and panel, Patricia Ferreira Para y Chapi. Thank you for being here, and thank you for the translators as well. I don't know their names, but <laughs> and also for the people in the kitchen, the heroes in the kitchen, always preparing things for us. Um, Maitland in Haiti, then Cuba, and finally hit the statues of the most Google search term in 2017. From archipelago to archipelago to archipelago. Superimposed, the satellite images of multiple uh, Atlantic hurricanes, hurricanes can draw a pattern of movement where trans-intentional natural forces contributed to the Middle Passage, forced uprooting of people and raw materials, preemptory, preemptory triangulations of trauma, treacherous extractionism, unbalanced capital accumulation, data transferred via water and underwater mediums. Edouard Glissant named this path, the fibril, a vivid fiber, a creature evolving from the flux and recurrence. All it produces stays in perpetual affective movement, not accounted in the programming of the slavers. A creature, criare, cria, creole. Located on the, on the first 600 kilometers of the Middle Passage, the, volcani the volcanic islands of the Cape Verde ac accommodated the first Atlantic societies previously uninhabited, the, isla the islands swift swiftly became the entrepot for African-American work networks. The area encompassing the estuaries of the Cacheu and Jeva rivers, forming the alluvian coast of the Guinea-Bissau, the, the adjacent Bisa uh, Bissagos Islands and Cape Verde archipelago, was called by the Guinean rivers of Cape Ber Cap Verde by the, the, by the Tugas, the Portuguese. Emblematically, they named the water, the offshores, the liquidity they most inhabited, and not the land. The, the, the Bujugu, that means Bijago, Bisago in Creole, ethnic group, always knew how to divert natural saps to poison the wells from where the invaders would, sit, would drink, and that the mangroves encircling the 88 islands of the archipelago would hindered the access to the shore and poison is but displaced ma substance. This is just a little uh, introduction to, um, to Marino as well because um, since uh, 2018, since early 2018, we have been um, working together uh, with the community in the Bijago Islands and uh, we have been experimenting, um, uh, bringing a moving image and, and uh, and technology to, to this place with a group called Kajiki that was founded uh, in 2014 by the militant filmmaker Sana Nahada. Uh, Sana Nahada, I worked with him many times. He was also in Berlin. Uh, uh, with him we digitized the, 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 the films from shot by the liberation movement uh, of, of the PHSC against uh, Portuguese colonization. Uh, between 1963 and 1974, and um, and Sana, after we finished the, the archive project, he asked me uh, to to uh, start helping him to to um, bring you know moving image to this to this group of um, young um, young Bizagos, and not only they are from the Bizago Islands, but they also um, uh, are you know from many different? I mean, they live there, but they are from many ethnic groups that 
that um, place themselves there. And, um, and I'm going to show you a little uh, exercise that we were uh, trying to do, and then I will introduce Marino. Can I have a little bit of lights? So, um, one, one, I just wanted to, to create a link also because there's people from, from Haiti here and uh, the, in, in Haiti there's the Bizango societies and uh, it's, it's known that actually the the I mean the, the Bizango societies that are the some of the voodoo societies they actually was supposed to be connected with the Bizago from 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 these islands from the archipelago. So just to make to create links here. So I'm introducing Marinho Pina, uh, born in Sonaco, Guinea-Bissau. He's currently attending his PhD program at uh, ESCTE uh, the, of the University of Lisbon, focusing on city planning and sacred places no? uh, of uh, the the Bissau of the capital of Guinea-Bissau that is called Bissau. Uh, he researches Guinea-Bissau and architecture and has a master degree on vernacular vernacular architecture and clay building. He is also perf a, per a perfor performing artist, storyteller, rapper, percussionist, calabash and jambe, uh, urban sketcher, filmmaker and a writer with published books. He, re he realizes workshops on poet poetry slam, spoken word, and therapeut therapeutic writing. He won the, Lis the Lisbon Poetry Slam contest in 2017. Since 2016, he has been working in the public management of AJASS, a social organization in Sonaco, which aims to improve the quality and of local education to fight against female geni genital mutilation Defore deforestation and AIDS. Since 2018, he is an honorary member of the, collect of the Collective Kajiki. 
You want to start? Uh, no. Or you want to say something? Do you hear me this way? Uh, at the back of the room? No. Good, well. Mike's there. Because I should uh, do something, I have to all this paper, all this mic, and there no more hands <laughs> from But <laughs> let's try. How? Marcado por um espaço. Tene John, Tene Verde, Tene Iago. Caminhos que las manga del. Outros curto, outros comprido. Tene furto, Tene coincoído. Tene chuva de sonhos fatfatido. Mantene também um bom quinhão de sonhos de bom sentido. Tene vacas. Bacas para o que mais tem nela. Tem pecador, tem limária, tem animal, tem tam plantas. Ilhas, descansa. Que ele zampa gai. Tem verde, tem água, tem céu, tem chão, tem chão, tem chão. Então, já sabes quem eu sou. O seu já me quem? Ampus. Em casa não pro me quem? Tame John o homem tame um bandeira, tame só as padas de terra na Santa Maria de Pedra que na boia no oceano que diz na de canto ano manga flano da chama da África, tame as padas de lugar que marcado com fronteira criado de qualquer maneira para fazer uma dessa de brancos leve cabeça que sinta na roda de mesa chamado de conferência de Berlim é panjang é panjanha gintes é ratiano padas padas é dividido entre eles é falar me de eles Traz do Chilin, nem agora é que consim. Terras com famílias em tido, confundido, é rapa tido na nacionalidade que te sido de fora, na dito, depois que os brancos bichos fica mais rico. Também se tinha uma de criação de Colón. A minha era baguine. Assim que tinha uma mas se tu gasta tomar é para não manter não o moedão o tal que também não casa mente guiné português forte leve semente da mim guiné esta era caminho que acabará firma se diante tomar com preço de sangue guiné que tem alça monso uma gigante na papel de liberdade o que agora na verdade tem ainda ferro na garganta Terra de valentes, terra de cobardes, terra de exolta e arde, mo calor de cor de chur. Para ver se não suma, é mandilna, para bater ter só filho de angamas, que te gosinda, é que a nota cuma, e te gajora ruma, é mar fitur se turma, com curba, na mata sonhos de cabral. A minha guina é bissau, a minha terra que está saindo de uma guerra para entrar na tudo guerra. A minha terra que se não são de repetição, e ter repetição com ele na são, na são. Um conceito de colom, um conceito de gintons que está para o interga na mão de um grupo som para fazer chocolis, para chocolis de separação. É tirar na mão de colom, que é que fala, me mante se fronteira, é troca sua bandeira, troca quem está mandando na terra, me continua na fazer mesmo merda, na tenta para muda, na estruma em outra cultura, é diz que se já cuma, é fala para cuma, a missão se injusta, injusta na cabeça pro, junta gintes que está daga sádio, que está entendendo é bádio, e está arrebentando tádio. Guiné, um terra, onde é que chefes junta com colona, chocolichão, para garantir ser quinhão, Chefe que discute na tarpa, se era tida se é cá, se é cansa, filho, se é raça. A mim vai guiné português, onde é que chefe pega teço na jugo susu, para ver de um blu, de que o Portugal está pui na se é júdio, para que a dissa maré muda, é de agassi cutuga, é de ana sentido luta, é panha cabral, é fúgia. Tudo 
si jets kuntu, bisa udana, tudu bo si jets kuntu, bisa udana, tudu bo si jets kuntu. Pronto. Chi è questa pagna? Povera casa. E da raggiare speranza. Mentre in chi bocca con confianza, non è alza pitu, non è morranza, non è alza pitu, ma è da leva poco per campanza. Campanza. Non è come che? Che è sanzi da armare, che è chiuna. E non c'è che da pagna povo a os, e da chi parte in otas, non fa si no gosta, non gosta, come la globalizzazione. E tu ti aguarda, non è la prima povo, sono la barca fuori di colonna. Chefe está com o mundo na porção, é da que está com o sol, é da que está com a porção que é que precisa de investimento estrangeiro. Mantém a pata que é o escritório de ser erro. Ela vem de mais terra, gosto do nome de desenvolvimento sustentável. Mas cada vez sobra nem pior, nem cadáver. Ora, colono com essa massa como é a população. Aonde? Não sei o que está na porção, não sei o que está na porção. Aonde? Porque eu posso mudar a porção de um filho. A minha dimensão é que era que não provocava e não produzia no nome do capitalismo, que era que não fatigava e não fatigava, e de que tem ele é sagrado, gosta de raro e não pode de ser filhos, e não pode de ser bandidos, como a pachoma do Cristo. Ele é que diz lá de manga de ano, 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 mas ano, e morado para aquilo mesmo por anos, e que filhos para ter donas, porque donas, porque tudo, 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 donas enterrado, mas que coisa é roubada, e que coisa é tão fundida entra na chonca sem o adicente. O som que te trazer para o naquele rio fica na frio. A minha inibição é que luta contra o colonialismo para poder ajudar seus filhos. Mas gosto de botar de chefes na ditado, na baleta, na abre péssima pateta, na unha em tiro para cuidar de moeda para ver torna mais pega, traz aqueles dentes que fude para eles e que não torna a fude eles mais sem falta. Pior agora é que o mar, o povo sempre que está paga para ver chefes é que está de agasse bianda com a gente que está bunda, bunda com carta, com uma sapo está com esse labor. Yo, é que lá. Sapo na nhinhi, pecador e nhane. A minha guiné, a minha chão, a minha língua, a minha língua que está mingua, a minha chão que está sempre na transformação, a minha comunicação, a minha música, a minha bajo, a minha cabaz, a minha tina, a minha sicô, a minha cor, a minha djembe, a minha tambor que pam, param, param, pam, pam, pum, da margarita morfeita, a minha cunha, a minha tabule, a minha balafão, a minha nhero, a minha toncorão, a minha quicinta, a minha dondão que está acompanhando de ambadão, a minha cusundê, a minha a palma, um tabate pé. A minha gumbé, a minha festa de monde, a minha prenchente, a minha manhuandade, a minha um tanque de água que na pera cabaz, a minha bantaba, a minha cajiqui, a minha canhaboque, a minha bumbulum, minha riqueza, e sou uma garaça do bulum. A mi lala pa tira paja, a mi tarafi, a mi tara, a mi cabacera, a mi palmera, a mi cibita da um madera, a mi bicilom, po de sangue, po de carbon, a mi polon, a mi manjenja, a mi nasinho pa tira corda, a mi malila pa maratapado, a mi firiquidja na metade morança, suma lembrança, segurança, a mi firiquidja na bubaranda.
Ami turu gintis, ami kaninging. Ami imigrante português, inglês, francês. Ami imigrante senegalês, gambiano, ami cabriano. Ami aqueles que pediram ali, ami aqueles que vêm que mistificar. Ami aqueles que moram nesse chão, com paz na seu coração. Ami guiné, ami mames... A minha guiné, a minha mamãe sofre dor, coia dor que chora, chor que chora, tio, para que ela suma cabral, é as malas de virgindes, cada quina se quintal, que ela encata seta, tem filhos pretos, tem filhos brumédios, tem filhos brancos, tem filhos li, tem eles em outros cantos, tem filhos na tudo parte, tem filhos santos, tem outros, ai credo, tocam também ele. A minha guiné, para ir a duas mamas, minha riqueza, e para bem estar curado de pureza. Para bem a minha guiné, a minha bem de mistura, a minha não é mistura. A minha guiné, a minha criol, a minha quilo um som som que não tem condão, mas que pode ir na contrada de fado com o jambadão. A minha guiné. So I'm going to, thank you so much, Marinho. I'm going to introduce Patricia Ferreira para Ichapi. Isha, Ichapi. Sorry. Um, very shortly, because she is actually hosting us here. <laughs> we are in her exhibition. Was born in 1985 in Cunha, Peru village, Misones, an Argentina Brazil border. At 13, she crossed the frontier to live in Salto do Jacuí in Brazil, and since 2000, has been living in Quenju. Encouraged by the workshops of Vidio nas Aldeias in 2007, she co-founded the Mbia Guarani Cinema Collective, dedicated to the producing videos and visual art, always focused on the Guarani culture. Thank you so much, Patricia, for being for hosting us here in your space. Can you contribute to this day? Thank you. Eu que agradeço o espaço, né, aqui, para estar aqui nesse espaço que que é muito importante para a gente, principalmente para nós Guarani, né? It is I who uh, is thankful, is thankful for the space, 
uh, given that this work is very important for us, the Guarani people. Um, eu não trouxe nada para botar ali porque já está cheio de coisinhas ali atrás. Então, só vou conversar um pouco sobre né, a memória que a gente tem sobre é, o nosso território ancestral. I didn't bring anything to show here, given that the space uh, already has a lot of the work that we produced. Uh, so I'm just going to have a brief contribution where I will be talking about uh, memory of our ancestral lands. Então, ao longo dos anos, a gente, nós, né, como que eu sou, faço parte da nação Guarani, e ao longo dos anos e nós fomos perdendo a no, o nosso território praticamente quase tudo hoje né que que os guarani vivem no, no Brasil em vários estados do Brasil e Argentina Paraguai uma parte de Bolívia e e Uruguai um, so I'm part of the Guarani uh, nation, and throughout the years, uh, we've lost pretty much all of our territory. And now we are dispersed, living in several states of uh, Brazil, Argentina, Uruguay, Paraguay, and even Bolivia. E, e hoje, a gente é, é no Brasil, somos o segundo é maior população é o Guarani, que estão aproximadamente uns 50 mil, né? É, e eles estão divididos em três, três grupos, que é eu sou Guarani Mbá, é, tenho o Guarani Caiová e tenho o Guarani Nhandeva. Um, so today, uh we are the second largest Guarani population. Uh, we are about 50,000 people. Uh, and uh, they divide us into uh, three groups. I am part of the Mivia group. Uh, and then there's this group. Segundos grupos. Guarani Cayova and Guarani Andeva. And then the other two groups are the Guarani Cayova and the Guarani Andeva. É, então, é, os Guarani hoje, elas estão, como eu falei, né, que eles estão quase perdendo todo o território, que onde é, era é, quase toda a América Latina era, era o nosso território, né, que que ao longo dos anos, é, como a gente, é, a gente caminha bastante, né, que a, gente é, é, a, gente, a nossa característica é caminhar em busca da terra sem mal, né, que isso é o nosso característica. Então, ao longo dos anos, é, fomos perdendo a nossa, o nosso território ancestral por conta desse desse processo, né, de, de caminhar e porque na época, na antigamente a gente sabia é, é, quando e quando a gente tem que sair daquele lugar e por quê? Porque a nossa espiritualidade está sempre nos movimentando por, pelos territórios ancestrais. Um, so the Warani people today, uh, we've uh, lost almost all of our territory. Um, almost all of, all of Latin America was our territory at some point. Um, maybe that's because our, uh, our main trait, what we're known for, is uh, for being the people that are looking for land without evil. And uh, in antiquity, in years before, we knew when to leave and why. 
uh, what lands to look for, uh, or spirituality uh, told us when. Então, esses, nesses territórios, então a gente tem essa memória de que a gente é, sobrevivia de, de é, nossos alimentos naturais, é, nossas medicinas naturais, e hoje a gente está quase perdendo tudo aquilo que era é, que nos fazia, que nos mantinha forte, né, através da de da nossa comida tradicional principalmente e, a, o, e os e os remédios né que eram naturais que a gente usava naturais a gente tem essa memória mas hoje em dia é, nós quase é, não temos mais como é, achar certas certas medicinas naturais que a gente procura né porque a gente é, praticamente não tem mais florestas, né, onde era nossa nosso território ancestral. É, e aí, então, hoje a gente está, é, principalmente os em Rio Grande do Sul, a gente está é, jogados na beira da, da estrada, na beira do das rodovias, né, é, por falta de, de demarcação realmente. Então a nossa luta hoje é a principal luta que a gente, os, os líderes, né, que estão na frente, é sobre a demarcação das terras, justamente porque a gente tem ainda essa memória de continuar com esse, com esse, com essas medicinas naturais, mas é, então, em busca disso, ainda a gente está atrás, é, caminhando, essas, buscando melhor, melhorias para nossas crianças, para os nossos velhos, porque são, são eles que, que, ao mesmo tempo, passam, né, as, a, que repassam as memórias da nossa cultura, e as crianças são os futuros, né? Que que é, são elas que vão continuar com a nossa, a nossa com os nossos cantos, danças, né? Então, é, para manter isso, é que hoje a nossa maior luta é sobre a demarcação das terras. Um. So, uh, in the in the territories is uh, where we keep our memory of how to survive, uh, our own foods and natural medicines. Um, but today, uh, we've lost that territory, uh, where we grow the foods and medicines that keep us strong. Uh, we've lost our ancestral lands uh, precisely because of demarcation unjust demarcation. Uh, we've been basically thrown to live on the sides of roads. Uh, and that's our struggle today. It's a struggle for just demarcation of our lands. Uh, our struggle is uh, for the children as they are the future. Uh, for those children that will keep the memory alive of our songs and our dances uh, and our costumes. So our main struggle today is one for just demarcation. É, então, é, antes da, da invasão né, dos, dos europeus, ou do homem branco, é, que a gente chama de Juruá, que é... Juruá significa é, homem com, com barba, né? Homem que, que tem pelo na, na boca. É, então antes disso a gente tinha, tinha tudo tinha não tinha nada o que se preocupar né e a gente é, a no, o nosso território é, nos dava tudo né aquilo que a gente precisava e hoje então é, nós guarani fomos um dos primeiros né a ter contato com os com esses de Uruacuera. É, Acho que tá bom. 
um, so before the invasion of European or white men, uh, whom we called Jurua, uh, which in our language means uh, uh, men with beards or men with hair on their mouths, um, we had everything. Um, uh, and this is because us Guarani were the first ones to have contact with these people. Então, desde essa, essa invasão, a gente vem sofrendo né, esses, é, é, agora a gente vem sofrendo por esses né, descendentes, que agora são, a gente chama de fazendeiros, que eles se apropriaram, continuam se apropriando das nossas terras, né, principalmente no Rio Grande do Sul, Mato Grosso, que eu falo dos Guarani Caiuvá também. É, e então, ao longo dos anos, a gente vem driblando para resistir e, e também utilizando as ferramentas, de, vários, vários tipos de ferramentas para a gente resistir. Né? Por exemplo, hoje eu estou com a câmera, eu estou usando as as ferramentas que não são da minha cultura, mas que eu eu transformo ela é, parte da minha cultura para poder lutar, né, e defender o meu o meu povo. So since uh, that moment of invasion, um, we've suffered uh, and we've kept on suffering from the descendants of those uh, men, those fazendeiros or landowners who keep appropriating our land uh, in places, uh, especially in the south of Brazil, like uh, Mato Grosso. Uh, and that means that we've had to look for ways to resist uh, and looking for tools to resist. In my, uh, in my experience, for example, the tool that I use is a camera, which isn't part of my culture, but which, I, which I've used um, as a tool of resistance. Porque essa invasão vem é, vem acontecendo sem, desde sempre, né? E vem a, é, afetando muito a nossa a nossa espiritualidade, né? Que como eu falei é, antes da chegada, né, a gente tinha de tudo, a gente não precisava de nada. E hoje, é, isso de alguma forma afetou a nossa espiritualidade, porque já, é, já falta é, terras, espaço para a gente continuar com aquilo que a gente é, praticava né, antigamente, como para o bem o bem viver, o, o cuidar do nosso espírito ad, através da alimentação, por exemplo. Então, isso é, afeta diretamente a nossa espiritualidade. Então, mas, mesmo assim, a gente continua tendo esse sonho de encontrar um lugar, um lugar bom para que a gente continue com essa prática. Né? So since that moment of invasion, uh, it has been an ongoing struggle. Uh, it has affected our spiritual life, uh, which uh, encompasses that moment when we had everything. Now we like the lands and the spaces where we can sustain uh, our spiritual life, our way of, of living. This uh, well living, or living well, um, which it's basically a manifestation of everything that's happening since our spiritual life uh, comes, or, or, or well spirituality comes from eating well. So there's a direct link between everything that's been happening and the struggles that we've had with keeping our spirituality alive. Então, ao longo dos anos, né, a, é, como eu falei, uh, viemos utilizando vários tipos de, de ferramentas para para resistir e primeiro a gente também utilizou as, as os papéis né o 
os documentos, mandando para os governos, essas coisas. né? Mas a gente também percebe, ao longo, ao, ao passar dos anos, né, que isso também não, não faz mais efeito. Então, a gente tem que procurar outra forma de, de lutar. So, throughout the years, uh, we've uh, learned to use different tools uh, to resist. First, we use paper, uh, writing and mailing governments. Uh, but we've learned that that's no longer effective. So we've had to look for other tools and other ways to to fight. Porque é, como a gente vai mandar os documentos, né? É, para os que, que estão né, é, governando o país, principalmente para os deputados, é, são totalmente da bancada ruralista, né, que estão aí e então, agora a gente tem que ir por outro caminho que, 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 que procurar outro caminho para que a gente é, ache algum aliado né, que é através da, do cinema, de, através do, de, de, de câmeras. Um. We noticed that uh, sending documents uh, was not useful uh, because we would be sending them to those that are in the government, uh, mostly uh, uh, representatives in government, which are, for the most part now, part of the ruralista or ruralist uh, movement. Uh, uh, parenthesis, the people that have been uh, politically active in expropriating lands. Uh, so we've had to look for alternative ways. Um, cinema and film has been uh, has provided that alternative because we're speaking directly to other types of people. Porque a gente está vendo muita, né? Principalmente, claro que aconteceu, sempre aconteceu, né? O a violência contra os povos indígenas, mas é, últimos tempos vem. É, subiu muito a uh, o porcentagem de, de assassinatos dos, dos líderes né que estavam na frente levando as nossas lutas a, lu a luta de todo mundo né principalmente os guarani caiová que estão aí enfrentando o diariamente essa luta então várias lideranças estão assassinados né no brasil e hoje com com esse sombrio presidente né, que a gente tem, é, a gente não tem quase mais é, por onde caminhar, por onde... Né? Mas, enfim, é, é, é um trabalho de cada um, de um trabalho de, de, da forma que, que cada pessoa, que cada povo trabalha né, para sobreviver a esse nesse tempo em que a gente está. É, então, é, não sei, mas de alguma forma a gente está forte lutando, não só é, os Guarani, mas todo o povo, os povos indígenas do Brasil, eu acho que de alguma forma estão, é, são eles que, que estão sendo fortes ah, na frente desse... desse um, it's always been violent against indigenous uh, peoples in Brazil, but in the last few years, particularly, there's been uh, a noted increase in the killing of our leaders, um, those that are leading the struggle for many of our nations, uh, particularly in the Guarani Cuba uh, nation. Um, So now, as we face this dark precedent, uh, we're looking for those ways of survival, those ways to fight. Um, and we are now in that time, in that moment, where we're looking for different vehicles and different ways to do so. Not only us, the Guarani, but all indigenous people in Brazil. Uh, we're all looking for a way to survive and we're looking for new ways of leadership. Um. Então, cada, cada povo, eu, 
acho que é, estão nas ruas, estão se unindo. Então, isso é, é a, nossa, a nossa força hoje, né? que a gente sai na rua né? contra esse... Ou pedindo a demarcação, ou pedindo o que, o que precisamos. Claro, não, não tem muito... Não, não ouvem muito a gente, mas a gente está aí na rua sempre. E, e nós, Guarani, né, temos um, um, uma organização que se chama Ivurupá, que, que é ele que, que hoje está tá na frente, né, é, principalmente para continuar a nossa repassar o, os ensinamentos né, que é, para nós mais jovens, esses conhecimentos ancestrais. E, além disso, então, é, são eles que estão na frente para levar a luta sobre a demarcação das terras. Né, que, então, essa é a única organização que a gente tem é o Gurupá, né, que abrange todo o território guarani, que é que no começo eu falei é, Argentina, Paraguai, Bolívia e vários estados do Brasil. Então, são eles que, que sempre estão se organizando para ir na rua levar os, os Guarani de cada aldeia, por exemplo, pra, principalmente para acontecer essa, essa manifestação em São Paulo, né, que muitas vezes é, a mídia, não sei se... Alguns de vocês conseguem ver essas, essas manifestações que acontecem em São Paulo. São, são por essa organização. É, por mais que é difícil, a gente está sempre se organizando para poder lutar. Né? E, então, eu luto da minha maneira com a, com a câmera. Obrigada. So, uh, each nation, uh, we are out on the streets, uh, and that actually is our strength right now, that we've been able uh, to unite, that we can go out on the streets and demand, for example, uh, just demarcation. Um, and there are different groups, for example, the Urupa um, group uh, from uh, us Warani that has been formed to, uh, among other things, pass on our ancestral knowledge. They're the ones that are poised to keep the fight alive. Uh, they are the ones that have been struggling out in the streets. They've been organizing by taking people from different villages out and organizing uh, different manifestations. For example, if you've seen uh, what little comes out in the media, Uh, for example, the different demonstrations in São Paulo, those are organized by this group. And they're also being effective in organizing different groups across different uh, nations and different states inside of Brazil. So we soldier on, we're always ready to come out into the fight. Thank you. Thank you so much, Patricia, uh, for your important statement and appeal of um, account of your struggle. And I'm going to pass now to Leo Pacarati. Uh, he's from, born in Easter Island. Uh, his name uh, of origin is, um, is Rapa Nui. Rapa Nui. And uh, he spent his childhood in Easter Island and then moved to Santiago de Chile to complete his studies in audiovisual communications and film directing in Arcos, University of in Santiago de Chile. Since 1993, he has been a local producer of a great number of audiovisual productions, television programs and TV spots. In 1998, he founded the first TV channel from Easter Island, Channel 13 Mata Ete Rapanui. Mata Ote Rapanui. 
where he was the director and programming director as well. The same year he created his own producing company, Mahatua, <laughs> Mahatua Producciones, which uh, offers audiovisual service to the Rapa Nui community, like institutional videos, TV spots, and educational programs. Between 2009 and 2011, he worked as the local producer of the Rapa Nui Film Fest, a film festival that takes place in Easter Island. In this context, he directed the short film Kao o Koe. Kao o Koe. Uh, in, in 2010, he created the first news, newspaper in Eastern Ireland, El Correo del Moin. Moin. El Correo del Moin. <laughs> of which he is the director until now. Thank you so much, Leo, for being here. Uh, hello everyone here. Uh, I try to speak English, it's not my language, I speak Maori, it's my mother language. Uh, but uh, I am a filmmaker. I tell history, I come in from a long tradition family tell stories. Uh, and my tool, and don't like me talk about weapons, um, my tool for building a new future, for constructing a new future, is the image, is the song. Um, this morning I code uh, one of my movies and made this fast uh, edition for you, and I wait you can read the subtitles over there, all right? Later we talk a little more. Somebody needed uh, we translate to Spanish? Excellent. This place is the British Museum in London. In 1868, uh, English boat go to Rapa Nui and stolen one moai. I carried my daughter for learn the generational line in my family. For the Polynesian people, the genealogical line are very important. This line, including the names, the our fathers, mothers, the our hills, the our rivers, the our harbors, because we believe all these elements make you are the person you are today. One thing made the colonialists in my island is change our names. They prohibit use our traditional names and we can use uh, Catholic names. My grand grandfather name is Ure Apotaje and they changed for Nicolás Pancracio. Mm. 
My grand grandmother, uh, Tapeta Aran Itaki, are from the Tuamotu Island, other uh, Polynesian island. Uh, she be married with my grand grandfather and traveled to Rapa Nui, but when she arrived to the island, she never understand why the Rapa Nui people give the sovereignty for the children. The people in the island had prohibition to go outside the town or live from the island. Mm -hmm. And this condition ended only in 1966, the year I born. We are slaves in our island for one half century. My father and his family made a boat for escape to Rapa Nui. But escape from Rapa Nui is escape from the more far place on the world. And they arrived uh, to Tuamotu Island from the uh, original island of our grand grandmother. My father. My father and his friends. In any storm, the people go outside the town and they take uh, good um, metal things, plastic things, carry for the waves. And using that material, my family building a boat for save his life. Of course, the Polynesians' name is no Polynesians. We, our name is Maori. In Hawaii, say Kanaka Maori. In Tahiti, say Taata Maori. In New Zealand and my island, Tangata Maori. This is the boat they build. Look the boat. <laughs> That is the Tuamotu archipelago. Moana Nui is big blue. That is the name from the planet. It's no land, it's blue. And this concept, mana, is maybe the more important concept in Polynesia. It's the energy, the soul, the spirit, the ability that people for resolve the problems. The Williamson Barfour Company is an English company, Lamb's company. They stay in the island for half century and they put in jail, in prison, my people, and really we don't have a good memories about the company. But we love the lands. One ship are more important than one human in Easter Island.
en la Guapín, tiene una puerta allá en, hacia donde está el, el, el muelle de, de cuya vela, y ya, está cerrada esa puerta. Y uno tiene que ir a sacar un permiso para salir a San We need permits for work in our land. He is the elder concert chief. Of course, then you don't have explanations. This one is the first film made in Rapa Nui, 1935, for Henry Stork. It's interesting the, uh, the off say the Rapa Nui are very Catholic, uh, very Catholic. Really, we mix it, the Catholic culture, uh, religion with our culture. We are religions, no Catholic. Actually, when the big cruiser's boat arrived to the island, one day before arriving, the people are sick because first came in the microbes and later the people. Alfonso Rapu direct a rebellion in the island. He conquered the civil rights for us. We are really Chileans in 1966.
and Alfonso R., the first major elected democracy in the island. The most strong mana, the most hard energy, is the synergy. When the people work together, all the people together can make the impossible. Many people say the Moai are carving and building for ETs, uh, merchants, people from other planets. But no, the Moai be made for my family, for my ancestors, for the Polynesian people. Uh, when I live in Mailand, for me are very strange when the people say the pyramids, the Moai, Stonehead, or other uh, all uh, First Nation construction are made for extraterrestrial people. Because when I stayed for first time in Europe, I saw the Domus in Milano, the big Coliseum, and all this is made for white people. For me, it's more hard building the Coliseus than carry a rock. Rock be carry around all the world. No? The rocks don't defend about you. Uh, you need really one thing, mana, concentration, energy. Uh, and when this energy function, all can be possible. Uh, we made building 1,000 moais. The more light, weigh three tons. The more heavy, 250 tons. Uh, and we transporting this status around all the island. No, because are beautiful. Because it's not beautiful <laughs> and a little ugly. Uh, it's because they are the living face, the our ancestors. The word called Moai. Moai is the word we use for say a statue. We call Te Aringa Ora o Te Tupuna, the living face, the our ancestors. Inside of this rock is the soul, the spirit, the energy, the our ancestors, and they care us 
over the ahu, over the platform, and looking inside the land, and looking inside the island, because they look in the people. They don't find somebody from the sky, or they don't wait for uh, people from the other side of the ocean. The more I wait, we, the Rapanui people, be happy. And this is my fight today. It's no more say the Chilean are bad people because the Chilean no are bad people. Chile is a, is a country with a bad design, you know, it's <laughs> bore grown. <laughs> it's not the fault to the people. It's the fault from the authority, from the people who have the power. They are guilty of any problem in Chile. Chile is a, is a country when the, uh, you are rich, you are rich all your life. And when you are poor, you are poor all your life. The colonialists in my island start when they take our soul and destroy. When they say, don't believe more in your God, and they change our God. Our God is a little crazy, have two eyes, very circulars. But the other guy in crucified, <laughs> it's, it's hard for us because we believe in the life. We not believe when you die, all ending. We believe your energy, your mana, continue. This body don't function anymore, of course, because it's a limited time for function. Huh? The colonization continue when they say, okay, don't use more your names. Because when we know our names, we know who are uh, I am. Uh, and we know uh, where is the place we're coming. Uh, uh, you need to know the history for know your present and make some good with your present. Uh, the Moai, the big Rapanui rock status, be carving with many sforce. It's hard work, it's a really hard work and are made not only for care of the Rapanui people, the Moai are made for care of the humanity. Today we know this Rapanui island is only other little planet in this big universal ocean. The Polynesians believe the Moana Nui, the big blue, are connected with the rest of the universe, are connected with the stars and others. Mm -hmm. uh, for end, I want to tell you the last day in your life, please be happy. And any day is the last day. Tomorrow don't exist, and yesterday is no anymore. Today is the day for be happy. Thank you so much, Leo. So I'm just making one. Uh, we still have a little time for uh, one question to each of our guests. Um, uh, so I start with Marino. Um, Marino, in your you know in your the text that you wrote uh, for the contribution, uh, you say that um, in Creole you say in Creole we say to indicate where we were born or where we belong to is La uh, Kinyabiko Nteru. Terado. Sorry. And uh, this means that is where my umbilical cord was buried. So this, um, I, I'm interested uh, particularly in this, in this um, idea of that you describe also here to your, the connection that you have with your mother. It's suddenly transferred to the connection to the land, to the earth. But, um, but there's also the dangers to interpret this as a kind of a claim for origin, like I come from that place and I'm the one belonging here and no one else. But this is something else what you mean here. Can you, can you discuss a little bit what, what does it mean? Also in the context of this multiple ethnic cultures. Um, uh, well, uh, before all the story about Guinea-Bissau, there were several people living there. And then some guys, came, some guys came and said, this belongs to us, we're going to build this thing, and he's going to uh, name that country, Portugal, blah, 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 etc. Uh, so people who live uh, in those places before, in the area that uh, is now as Guinea-Bissau today, uh, it's not like they don't fight with each other, or they don't fight because of lands of 
everything. But there is all, but there is always um, a way of uh, um, kind of ethical rules that uh, everyone belongs. If you came, you want to live in peace. You you belong to this place. So. Um, Um, okay. If you came, uh, you want to live here, you belong. Uh, for example, I can make uh, all of you uh, honorari honorables, honorarium, gu guinean. <laughs> yeah, uh, because uh, what happened is we were born there, but we didn't do anything to be born there or to born there. It just happened. We could born everywhere. We could born white, blue, everything else. So we accept. We born there. We born here, and we have this link uh, uh, to the earth through our umbilical cord. And also, we used to say, "I'm in Fiji, John." That means I am son of the land. I am uh, son of the land. Uh, and uh, it's like, uh, and the land is. Uh, we, well, we used to think the land is just a mass, united mass with water around. So all the land is the same land. You're born in a land, you belong to the land, no matter where. So everyone also that came is welcome. He can belong if you want to leave it to us. That's, that used to be the sense. Now it's kind of different because, well, uh, some people s come and say, this is us, this, is be this belongs to us, and uh, uh, you have to find your place. Then we started to use the uh, like same thing, same weapon, same uh, discourse also. Many things changed since land today also became a monetable uh, thing. Uh, selling land, marking frontier, this belong to me. When people used to live, this belong to all of us, community. Because you cannot go anywhere without the community. Uh, we, we have also this saying in Bissau, if your house is burning, it will be your neighbor that will come to help you extinguish the fire. So you have to work with your neighbor to not be sick in the day that you House may burn, I don't know. Uh, for example, now in Guinea-Bissau, we, we super divided since 2015. We've been super divided because of political uh, interest. And uh, uh, that's why in, in last year, I showed some of images. We were watching the, the statue, the first, that is a symbol of uh, resistance in Guinea-Bissau. And uh, now is a pale memory of uh, of all the resistance we built against the, uh, the oppressors, and uh, we did the, uh, that uh, a lot of performance and a lot of uh, workshops uh, going uh, to neighbors neighborhoods and to schools, university uh, markets. Ask people to print their hands in the clothes. Then we cover the statue with that. Inv invisible, invisibilizing, making the statue invisible, but bringing its visibility more even because we, we hide it. Then people started to talk about the statue, about what it means, its names. Even if we should do that thing. But uh, for, for one day, we were around Play, uh, we were together playing around of uh, the same thing. Uh, it was super nice. And that's also, I don't like m much the word weapon, but more tools. I think it's a fine tool to bring people together. Uh, when people enjoy themselves, when people share, uh, the moment we forgot that uh, uh, there's tomorrow. We just, it is today. We're gonna Fucking do it nice. <laughs> Thank you so much, Marie. And you also you also uh, made one fist, one monumental fist, 
uh, multiple fists, no, and multiple hands. And okay. yeah. uh, it was a closed fist. We made we made it very open hands, so it doesn't belong to no one. And uh, so many colors also, because the color is an issue to, uh, also in Guinea Bissau. For example, in Guinea Bissau, I am white. Yeah, it's a, as I used to say, 50 shades of white, 50 shades of black. Thank you so much. So um, I'm going to, to also pass to, to Patricia again. I, I would love to, to enter a little bit also the, uh, because you gave us such an important um, uh, a picture of the, the, the struggle at the moment and, and the problems in, in, in your land. And um, in, in two years ago, I think uh, we showed here, I mean, actually I curated a, sm a small screening where we showed a film that you could curate it with the, the, um, with the team from Vidas Nasaldeish and As Bicicletas de Nanandu. And um, this film, I this film uh, for me, it's so, such a key film also to understand your work and, and it's also like a kind of a film that shows us um, the, the traces of like Western ignorance in a way. And, um, and also uh, I'm, I was very interested in the particularity of the language because uh, in a way you feel the camera is f actually, um, I mean the, the script doesn't, it's, it, it's actually happening by the camera following certain actions and things that are happening. And um, there is one, for example, one particular, uh, for example, there, there is children that are kind of conducting the, the, the script, actually, uh, from one side. And then there's also uh, one moment where a lightning is um, uh, attacks, uh, a lightning falls on a, on, a, on a tree. And then there's a woman that wants to, wants to have a little bit of that wood from that uh, tree that got burned by the lightning and because there's a particular event that happened there. Can you talk a little bit about this language that you developed in this process, you know, this, this cinematic language that you, to channel your culture and your, um, your struggles? We have to wait for translation, sorry. Então, a gente trabalha muito em coletivo, né? com todos os filmes que a gente faz, é, a maioria são do coletivo. É, o que ela está falando é do filme Bicicletas de Nyanderu, que justamente é, fala uma cena em que uma senhora mais velha, né? É, faz um, uma cruz, justamente, né? uma cruz que também já é uma mistura de, de, de cultura, digamos assim, né? que onde ela é, produz, é, faz uma cruz é, de uma árvore onde o raio atingiu. Né? Então, a gente trabalha muito essa questão do real, né, que acontece, na, por exemplo, naquele momento, quando a gente estava fazendo uma oficina é, com os meninos, a conversa daquele momento era o, o, o raio né, que atingiu uma árvore. Então, é, a gente trabalha muito é, com, com o real, assim, o, naquele momento... 
o que estava acontecendo quando é, a gente está filmando. Então, todos os filmes que a gente faz é daquele, daquele o que estava acontecendo, o que as pessoas estavam mais interessadas em, em falar naquele momento. Um, so uh, we work collectively, we work as a collective. Uh, most of the people that are involved in the making of the films uh, are part of the collective. Um, so for example, for this film that you refer to, uh, Bicycles, uh, uh -huh. uh, so the scene that, that we are referring to, uh, it's a scene that captures a woman uh, making a cross from a tree that was hit by lightning. So what we wanted to do, and, and what we often do, is that we deal with that moment, that moment of, of reality, what's happening at that time. Uh, that other scene, for example, uh, with the kids, the topic at hand uh, was the strike of lightning. So that's what we were actually uh, depicting or capturing at the moment, because that was what was happening um, in the moment. So in a way, the script is a negotiation between uh, the natural events and also how you actually see them and follow them and and document them. É, então a gente é, trabalha com o roteiro depois da, das filmagens que que acho que é o contrário que geralmente fazem, fazem primeiro o roteiro e depois filmam, mas a gente trabalha ao contrário. Então a gente cria o roteiro junto com os personagens, assim, que é, depois de cada filme, de, de, depois de, no dia, né, filmam e à noite a gente assiste com o pessoal e na hora da edição a gente cria o, o roteiro. Uh, yeah, so interestingly enough, we, we basically create the script after filming. So uh, instead of uh, most cinema, when you create the script and then you go film, we do it the other way around. Um, and basically the process is that after a full day of filming, we sit down with everybody and we identify the, the characters and the stories that are coming out. Uh, and that's how we create uh, the script. Thank you so much, Patricia. We have to follow. Go thank, on, you. thank you. Um, <laughs> Leo, just also a short question because we are um, already over the time. And uh, I just wanted to, to, uh, to address one issue that I think is also transversal to, to all these um, uh, colonial oppre oppressions on, on indigenous people and on... on, on um, uh, and, and this actually this engineering of poverty, like this, in, this colonial engineering of poverty, the, coloni the colonial engineering of disease, and the colonial engineering of famine. I mean, all these things are, were not there, you know, like there was no poverty, the people are rich, these lands are normally very, you know, nature gives everything. Um, so this is all uh, constructions that are uh, created and then they also like the colonialists op often appear also as the saviors of these problems that they they were the ones creating it and you there was this this example that you that you gave with the with the uh, lepra for example there can you address a little bit uh, these issues thank you the first i think is in the coronavirus today for example <laughs> create realities post-realities, post-truth, is part of this new century. Um, the chase the my people in Israel. Um, we believe exists a manual, colonialist manual. Huh? This colonialist manual say, destroy the temple that is new uh, indigenous people. Don't uh, give permits for these people to speak in their language. Uh, destroy the spirit of these people. And other more point. I think this is the same in all the world. Huh? This colonialist manual. I don't know if it exists or no. 
if don't exist, it's, it's more hard too because it's a it's an occidental vision about this. Um, when my island, in my land, uh, we are only one hundred and ten persons. In the anthropologists anthropology say we are twenty thousand. Uh, 20,000 peoples in the past. And when we are only 100, uh, we thinking we are dead. Our culture ending. And we saw our face and say, okay, we start the orgy <laughs> because we need more people. And we work hard for one century, and actually we are 6,000 persons around the world, and the, the, the Polynesian people. And um, really I think uh, all these bad things made for the, the old colonialist vision, I feel all this change, slowly, but change. Look at this panel here, all these people coming to this place for listeners, in one century ago, when the South American indigenous come into Europe, they be present in circus, inside the museums, like animals strange. Huh? Uh, today we come in and we are filmmakers, artists, uh, <laughs> and, and put a red carpet for us. Something is changed, you know? <laughs> it's, it's, it's not the same thing. But really I want the people don't have curiosity for my culture. I want the people have the respect for my culture. Because I respect the others. If I come in here, I come with clothes. I never use clothes. I use a short, some sandals, and a little t-shirt. Um, I, 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 I feel cool in this. Uh, city. I tried to find the Berlin beer, but I think it's inside the cave because it's very cool outside. And <laughs> really, today, uh, uh, for us, the more important is sometimes he say, she say, and many others uh, directors say, we need to talk our history. We. I don't need any more National Geographic or Discovery Channel for say, the more is be made for the ETs. <laughs> <laughs> Ancient allegiance. <laughs> what shit, man? No. If the human don't have the capacity to carving a rock and moving, we don't... We don't deserve... Be alive. In my culture, when you offense a other, you call rock. Rock. Because the rock don't have feeling, don't move. It's a rock. You can take the rock and put it in other place. Don't have spirit. When the rock has a spirit, when we decide the spirit that our ancestors is inside, and when we decide it's not anymore inside, we broke the rock and carved another big one for, because the spirit of my ancestor grow. You know? I try to tell us, uh, it's true this colonialist vision destroy communities, peoples, family, all this is true. But like my ancestors, when the first one decided made a, a big moai, a big statue, 75 tons, and say, hey, we carving this statue and we moving for the other corner to the island. My people start working. Don't be sit. They don't say, oh, it's difficult, or it's impossible, or call the ET for help us. No, they don't say nothing to them. They start working hard with the soul. They start the life. They start any day the life because any night we lose our life too. Thank you so much, Leo. Thank you, Patricia. Thank you, Marie. Thank you all.
Thank you so much also to Philippa César and to the panel. We will have a 30 minute break. We will serve some food over there. And afterwards we will come back for um, a screening.
And it's titled Coalitions, Common Practices, and Collective Healing. And I'm fascinated by the sheer fact that thinking of art making, doing films, working together, disseminating films, and therefore knowledges, we can consider that an act of healing. And if I were to summarize um, the practice of the Wapikoni, it might be that. So I, I'll basically do a, a brief introduction of um, the Wapikoni and of Odile Joannet. And it's important for, us to, for me to read this because I don't want to miss anything. So I'll, I'll read. So basically what we're going to do in this section is um, show five short films. And uh, our dear friend and brother, Timber, whom I'll introduce also in a bit, would, um, who will also be part of the next panel, will do a conversation with them um, after the, the, the screening. So Wapikoni is a Canadian indigenous community uh, based organization that is breaking the barriers of accessibility and elevating traditional capacity training models to empower the next generation of creators. It offers mobile creative studios in indigenous voices worldwide. It offers mobile distribution initiatives to meet the public in their original spaces of, and of gathering. The methodology offers narrative sovereignty and allows for the development of an indigenous artistic signature and a decolonized vision of excellence. And I like the choice of words here. There is excellence, there is collectivity, and there's also the possibility of narrating stories in our own ways. That is a choice. And there's also the possibility of asking our question, where do we find knowledge? So that is found in, in the narration itself, but in also in the ways of narrating, the structure of narrating. And I think it's also found in the way and the choice of who our audiences are going to be. The collection of over 1,200 short films and its human collective of thousands of artists and creators is traveling the world to engage in conversations that proposes a shift in worldviews and a recalibrating of privilege. And I think it's an honor for us to have some of them here today to be with us, to show some of the films, and to talk about their practices. So Odile, who's a member of the Inu community of Pasamit on Quebec's Côte Nord. For close to 20 years, Odile, I'll, I'll read it, because I think, you know, this matters. So bear with me. For close to 20 years, Odile Jeanette has been striving to uphold and promote the rights of indigenous peoples and to improve their living conditions. From 2017 to 2019, she served on the Ordre de Montreal board and is one of 15 members of the tab uh, Table on Diversity, Inclusion and Anti-Discrimination. A graduate of UCAM, is that how it's called? Specialized in communications and public relations, she became involved with the Quebec Native Women's Movement in 2002. Five years later, she collaborated on developing and opening Montreal's first indigenous daycare center and helped create the Montreal uh, Urban Aboriginal Community Strategy Network. She's, founding member, she's a founding member and administrator of Destinations, International Crossroads of the Arts and Cultures of Aboriginal Peoples, and remains committed to making Montreal a major destination for indigenous culture and tourism. In 2018, she became the executive director of Wapikoni Mobile, as I said before, an indigenous organization that fosters artistic creation and excellence to serve narrative sovereignty of nations. So I have to read this because 
Sometimes we come to such gatherings and we assume that we know people. Some of us take this and we read them. Some of us take them and just dump them. So I think every word counts and it's important to know each person. So we've been in contact with Temba for over a year and a half now on different occasions. He's come by to see exhibitions here, but uh, has also supported us in many ways in networking, putting us in, co in connection with a lot of people doing um, filmic practices all over the world, and especially in relation to uh, our, uh, the, the, the work we're doing here as a collective, you know, which was initiated by Abhishek Nilamba, um, United Screens. So Temba <clears throat> has been in charge of diversity and inclusion at the last three editions of the European Film Market in the, of the Berlinale. After working for almost a decade in international film sales, his work comprises curating and programming a series of events on the market relevance of diversity and inclusion across the EFM's in, uh, industry platforms, collaborating on events with other Berlinale internal and external organizations and knowledge partners creating awareness and visibility for all programs, actions, and promotions of DNI across all the Berlinale's different entities and liaising with delegations formed by underrepresented groups. So we just had a conversation earlier about the choice or the, or the spaces we find ourselves in. Sometimes we come to this big festival and, um, you know, there are these kind of spaces that are supposed to serve as, you know, springboards or passages to something. But to what? That something is supposed to be a kind of a mainstream. So in the conversation, we're actually thinking about the possibilities of us organizing ourselves in our own spaces and the imp importance of those empowerment structures and the impossibility of letting ourselves to be defined by others. And I found that important, and I think that this is, in my opinion, a core of what Tim, uh, uh, he's been doing, Timber has been doing in the past years, while at the same time subverting the existing structures. At the 2019 Durban Film uh, Mart, Temba spearheaded Engage at DFM, a, seri a series of curated think tank conversations on the pertinent, challenging, and multifaceted questions facing the African film industry. With Temba still on board, Engage has now become an independent project of curated think tank conversations of the African and African diaspora screen industries affiliated to the South African organization's steps. So now, as Yibrija Mameti said, in making films, he's speaking la grammaire de ma grand-mère, the grammar of his grandmother. How do we think of an aesthetic that is based within the grammar of our, of our grandmothers? And I think that is very important. And I also think that it's very important to see the way these practices can come together with the different peoples of this world that are interested in the grammars of their grandmothers through coalitions, through different alliances, through different ways of thinking about how we will be in this world together. So on that note, I'll leave the floor to you guys into the films so thank you very much Kwe Kwe uh, greetings my relatives thank you so much for having me thank you Tamba for creating this moment with us uh, as we do in my territories and land I want to ask Gloria to come and offer a few words. 
We often ask our elders to kind of open the ceremony with us, this gathering. Thank the creators for being together today. So kind of want to ask Gloria to do that for me. Anything will do. White Hukwai Tap. White Hukwai Tap. In my language, that means hello, everyone. I am from British Columbia, which is the west coast of Canada. I am from the Sahuatmuk. The English call us Shushwap. I'm from the Sahuatmuk people. It's an honor to be here and an honor to be asked to speak to you to say opening words. And my words are welcome. I ask the Creator, now that it's coming to the end of our day, we thank the Creator for everything He has given us today the food, the friendships. And I ask the Creator to give us a restful sleep tonight so that we can do all the work that we have tomorrow to do with strength and energy. Cook champ. Cook to Cal Cook Beak. That means thank you, Creator. And I'll do a very brief welcoming song for you in my language. Thank you. That's how we always do it. We have to give the voice to our elders, those that carry the wisdom. It's really, really important. So Wapikoni, yes, I'm the new executive, well new, it's going to be two years now, executive director of Wapikoni, but I am the first indigenous executive director to hold this position. So it's really, really a privilege for me. And I do believe in the power of art, art to transform both inside and our societies. We also believe that the voices of our excluded brothers and sisters of this world, the invisibilized voices from the colonial practices must be heard to create balance uh, and to come back to the core of our values that are important to saving our humanity. Uh, so it's all about giving a voice, believing in the talent. We live in very small communities, very isolated communities, we have no access to anything to create. So Wapakoni is all about breaking those barriers of accessibility by providing mobile creative studios completely equipped with audiovisual equipment and with a mentorship idea of training. There's no barriers to participation, there's no application form, there's no selection committee. Anybody that has an idea that wants to contribute, explore, are just interested can take part in the Wapikoni. We s come to the community when we are invited. We stay with the community for about four to five weeks. 
And within that period, between 25 to 30 participants, younger, 10-year-old, to the most old, eldest, 66 years old, use the tools to create short films. And they create within that period between four to eight short films in four to five weeks. No barriers, no schedule. The schedule is developed with them to consider their family responsibilities, their work or school responsibilities. So everything is created with the people. So it's all about original storytelling. We know how it's gonna start, but we never know how it's gonna end. We never know how it's gonna flow. It's going to adapt to the people, to the community, to the needs. It's all about narrative sovereignty. There's no direction. Nobody's coming with the school of cinema in their pockets. They're just showing them how to use the tool and then they're telling them, do it the way you wanna do it, the way your grandparents used to tell you those stories. Do it in your own way, break the rules. I often say we recognize American cinema, we recognize French cinema. I know we will one day recognize indigenous cinema as a specific indigenous signature and artistic signature. We just need to leave that space of creation. So let's watch five short films. I have filmmakers with me. We were here with the delegation, so I was really, really happy. And afterwards, we'll share a little bit of our experience, but enjoy the films. Une vague impression de retour dans le temps. Un temps sans hâte, sans bouteille. Un temps de culture et de pêche. Un temps d'enfant, de rire et de ressourcement. Ou on sait comme on s'aime. Ou un Indien est un Indien. Ou un humain est un humain. Ou j'étais moi leur petite sœur. Je n'étais pas dépaysée. Leur terre existait déjà quelque part en moi. J'étais profondément en paix. Au cœur de chacun, l'âme de la forêt. Un pays de l'esprit, vibrant, vivant. Mm-hmm. <laughs> 
Une terre de géants coulée dans nos veines. À Mishnabek, à chaque moment, vous étiez là, à moi. Dans ma fierté d'être à Mishnabekwe. J'ai rencontré cet ailleurs qui nous ressemble tellement et j'ai envie de rallumer la flamme, notre flamme Anishnabe. Libérons-nous de nos blessures. Rien, prenons enfin notre nature. Nous sommes les enfants de deux mondes, un pied sur le béton, l'autre entre les herbes sauvages. Certains diront la pomme, rouge dehors, blanc dedans. Moi, je dis le fruit, assez mûr aujourd'hui pour s'inventer un nouveau chemin, un moucassin. Let me talk about the first film. The first film that you saw was done from Evelyne Papati. She lives in a community in Canada where there's no water, no electricity still to this date. When she traveled to Brazil to discover that it was like home for her, it's really because even in Canada, we still have communities that have no running water, no electricity. And that community is living right beside an hydro den, right beside a big, big industrial company that uh, offers electricity to the entire province. So I think it's a very powerful film. And at the end of the film, she refers to being an apple. And she says being red outside and white inside. And it's something that we've been struggling a lot with, that idea of being an apple or losing or losing your culture. Or how, how can you leave your community and still stay yourself? So that's why the second film is also extremely powerful, because it's done very recently. So it's Well, first film done 12 years ago, and the second film was done 2017, 18. Jamie here was involved, 18. So it's just powerful to see the links between so long from each other, but at the same time so close. Did you guys think so? <laughs> Wa 
Agude e i dogo e nu i ziki skino homagnak. Njem kozhgan a rishpec në wabzin. E kem skaman ma shkozi wen. Ki dzini ga duma në odena. Ki dzi kemi rodi bërta ma dzuan në bima dzi wen. Egasin man kam kwashik e i zhidar ta guzan. Nenne, ta voj ga zhi e zhina guzan, kare kishta ma dzuan. Kwao, wabao, uzawao, mirad gut. Ta brak nid birwa nen, mi du e uru demik ke gut man e da bit. Ki dzit bërtë ma të zuna njuk, angunin hega ma u dzik shki huna njuk. Wa me nenen. Agu de e i da gwa ni u di ki ski na hon magnak. Njem ko zhgan a rish pec ni wabzin. E kem ska man ma shko zi wen. Ki di ni ga du ma ni u dana. Ki di ki mi ro di bërta ma dzuan ni bi ma dzi wen. Egasin man kam kwa shik e i zhidar ta guzan. Nenne, ta voj ga zhi e zhina guzan, kare kishta ma dzuan. Kwao, wabao, uzawao, mirad gut. Ta brak nid birwa nen, mi du e uru demik ke gut man e da bit. Ki dzit bërtë ma dzuna njuk, angunin hega ma u dzik shki huna njuk.
Quand on veut se faire entendre, il faut toujours faire des blocus, il faut faire des barricades, il faut faire des manifestations. Moi, je ne veux pas laisser en héritage ça à mes enfants. S'ils veulent se faire entendre, ils vont encore ériger des, des barricades. Non. Donc, vous êtes prête à défier la loi, finalement? Oui. Et ça, la loi et l'abus de pouvoir. Mais il y a quand même des dangers d'outrage au tribunal. Ça sera encore quelque chose qui serait contre vous. Vous ah. savez, avant l'arrivée des premiers euh, européens, je dirais, on n'avait pas ces genres de lois là Il n'y avait pas de loi. Je ne sais, je, je sais pas sur quelle loi je peux défendre nos droits. Je ne sais pas. C'est probablement au courant de l'ordonnance déjà. Alors, je vais juste faire comme hier, je vais la remettre à qui de droit. J'en ai des copies supplémentaires pour les autres, OK? Je les dépose par terre comme c'est comme, okay? comme, comme hier, OK? Comme hier, comme ça ici, OK? On peut voir. C'est bon, le feu avec OK, je vous remercie. Bye-bye. La dite injonction ordonne aux défendeurs de s'abstenir, de bloquer ou de nuire de quelque façon que ce soit au libre passage des personnes et des véhicules sur la 138.
J'entends encore sans cesse les cris de rage et les pleurs de désespoir des miens. J'ai vu des femmes défendre la mère terre avec des chants de paix. J'ai vu mon peuple se faire refouler sur ses propres terres par des étrangers casqués. J'ai vu des aînés verser des larmes de fierté oubliées. Comment défendre notre héritage et l'avenir de nos enfants contre ces géants de l'argent je pleure pour toutes les rivières qu'ils détourneront, pour toutes les forêts qu'ils saccageront, pour toutes les terres qu'ils inonderont, pour toutes ces montagnes qui disparaîtront. Je leur dirai du plus profond de mon âme toujours non. Mes entrailles brûlent d'un feu avec lequel étaient forgés sur l'autel des castors de mon grand-père. Mon voyage est fait de ces visions d'autrefois, du souvenir brûlant de nos récits de tradition de nos marches dans les bois, arrachés à nos mères et à nos terres, qui, elles, lentement se fondent dans le flou artistique des écrans de télévision de ces caméras sans équivoque qui se parlent de nous sans réciproque intention. Nous nous soulèverons. Notre nom sera les vibrants de couleurs rouge peau car nous vibrerons. Au rythme des tambours et des feuillages de nos arbres qui dansent sous les vents de l'aube, juchés entre nuages et terre, à emplir les lents de la blessure vive d'un chant nouveau courant les terres, le cri des inondés. Nous nous soulèverons, maman, que ce nom nous nous soulèverons et nous apporterons la lumière au monde. Comptons les années perdues sur les chapelets de nos grands-mères. Partons sur les routes d'asphalte du pays pour le nouveau portage. Saut d'eau à la main, canot sur le dos. Le vent
faisons le point pour que lorsque nous rentrerons chez soi, à la fin des batailles juridiques et territoriales, nous murmurerons à l'oreille de nos grands-parents que nous aurons remporté la lutte longue de notre détermination et de la justice environnementale. Laissons à la terre ce qui appartient à la terre. Le message est immense et il traversera les terres, et la vie, et la vibration, et la vision de nos grands-pères. Construisons les relations qui bâtiront entre les peuples et les nations le sensible fil de l'intime conviction. Que nous devons ensemble bercer notre territoire aimé, retracé, retissé, désormais en nos bras salis par le fuel et le liquide de fourbe du bitume des sables mouvants noirs de l'Alberto brisé. Rétablissons les racines reliant nos ancêtres à nos enfants et nous avancerons fort de l'enseignement de l'univers, du territoire et de la lumière. Nous nous soulèverons. Notre nom sera les vibrants de couleur rouge peau car nous vibrerons au rythme des tambours et des feuillages de nos arbres qui dansent sous les vents de l'aube, juchés entre nuages et terre, à emplir les lents de la blessure vive d'un chant nouveau courant les terres, le cri des indomptés. Nous nous soulèverons, maman que nous, nous nous soulèverons et nous apporterons la lumière au monde. Chachiche ne moudena ne te bushkat, et à le moniat me les gâche mouknin à vous pester le mien. Chache moi abden pédabun ou de obdenat, l'in de sinan ne te goûte karkat, hache moi abman piham, tu es de maintenant. Wa ben no da yat, ne me l'elden et lui yan, wa ben no da yat, karkat non nin te jikod nat moudéa, noach pogouhel de mou. Fabriquée de la crainte et de la puissance, mêlée entre les troncs de la pinette, je suis née à mon tour, habitée d'un cri, d'un seul cri. Atok, Schwabmo, Megan. Atok, Schwabmo, Inno. Come join me. Come join me so that we can talk all together. Come. Janine, come too. You were involved. <laughs> Blockus 138, it was your hometown. <laughs> yep. <laughs> I always like to take you on the surprise, you yeah, know? Always. <laughs> <laughs> so that's five of 1,300 films that were done by so many people and so many spirits in different ways. And I think the program kind of also highlights how there's different genres that are being used, animation, uh, poetry, um, documentary. Uh, it's kind of to show the power of, of our peoples, and it's all about um, bringing our stories to life and our spirits. You want to say something? Because I know. For generations, 
they took us from our nomadic way of life and put us onto small Indian reserves, very small. And we could not go out and hunt and gather our medicines. So we depended on the welfare system. And you know, on welfare, you can buy bad food full of salt and carbohydrates. The worst thing in our First Nations community, the indigenous community in Canada, is diabetes. So many of my people are obese and suffering from diabetes. At the same time, they took us from our communities as children and put us into Indian residential schools where we were beaten and sexually abused and separated from our parents for months, if not years. Some children were in those schools all year for 11 years away from their parents. So their culture was gone. And they went home, and their parents were drunks because why should they be good when their children are gone? And those same parents, they turned to alcohol and anything else out there to, to ease the hurt. So for generations, this happened. I'm 66. I was in a residential school for four years, and four years in a foster home far away from my people. As soon as I could, when I finished grade 12, I took a plastic bag of my clothes, and I went home because I knew I had to go home. I had no li very little culture. My mom was probably murdered. My dad died in jail. You look at the skirt I made. It has the red hand on it. It's the hand of blood that covers our women's mouths and makes them silent because thousands of my indigenous sisters are missing or dead in Canada. And you think of Canada as a very strong, democratic, free country. But I am afraid as a woman of color to walk on the highway or down the street because I'm afraid I will become one of the missing and murdered indigenous women. But something is happening in Canada. I graduated from law school in 1994, and I had 14 of my brothers and sisters beside me. That was 26 years ago, and that's one university in Canada. Today, they will have graduated more than 300 since I graduated law school. So something is happening in Canada. We are getting stronger. I cried at the first resistance film because it's happening today. This morning in, in my nation, there are more than 30 nations in British Columbia, one of our provinces. In my nation, 45 minutes from my home, we have a blockade because of a liquid natural gas pipeline that is going through one of the communities in the north. And this morning, they arrested in my nation because we're supporting those people. They arrested a hereditary chief and a woman and a visitor supporter from another nation. And this is happening today. So I cry. But what Canada and the world has to understand is that we are getting stronger. I told you about graduating lawyers. We're graduating social workers. We're graduating teachers. We have beautiful people like this helping us to tell our story and bring it to the world. So I'm sorry for the emotion that I have, but it's what I have in my heart, and I have to share that. I was chief of my community for two terms, and the elders said, once you're a chief, you're always a chief. So I stand up. My father was chief, and I'm following in his footsteps. I stand up as a chief, and I try to be strong and tell the world, this is still happening to the indigenous people in Canada, and we ask for your sympathy and your understanding and your support. Cookstrand, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Gloria. It is happening. 
It's happening. Um, Wapi Kodi has existed for 15 years. Um, we've obviously had an example of the testimony of the power of Wapi Kodi, of the work that you're doing, of the empowerment, of the capacity building that we've seen in the films. Um, we've heard from you the objectives of Wapi Kodi. Um, walk us through the inception of Wapi Kodi 15 years ago. Tell us how, how this came about. Wapi Kodi actually means Tazawa in in Atikamek. Yeah. Um, so yeah, give us the inception story of, of, uh, yeah. of Wapi Kodi. So Wapikoni was initiated 15 years ago by a non-indigenous filmmaker that was completely flabbergasted <laughs> about the invisibility of indigenous peoples. And she started 20 years ago uh, in an Atikamek community working with this young woman called Wapikoni Awashish, trying to document the story of the Atikamek nation and the values. And unfortunately, like, like with all, like with many of our indigenous communities, we share the, the roads with deforestation companies. And she was struck by a logging truck and died instantly at the peak. Uh, our peoples believe in the power of our contributions and get involved and believe in our capacities and believe in the worth of our words. So that's how Manon Barbeau, who's the co-founder of all of this, scribbled the idea of this mobile studio. Because it's believing that talent is there, but we just don't have access to the tools and the spaces. So we started with a little small caravan doing a few communities, uh, four or five communities a year. And to date, we do about 20 to 25 communities in Canada, and we visit five to six communities worldwide. We transfer the methodology that was taught for indigenous people to all excluded voices. We've been to Jordan, Palestine, Syrian refugees in Turkey. We work with the Roma population in Hungary. We believe in the voices of the excluded worldwide and the power of that voice to be integrated in social debate. When I first started, there was this big gathering of all of the presidents, the G7 gathering, and it was on our territory in Quebec. And I remember calling AMC, um, which is the, the Ministry of Canada responsible for the international relationships. And I said, how is the youth voices is going to be included in this, in this big president, all presidents of the world being gathered? And they obviously had no answer. So I recommended a Wapikoni program. So 12 films of Wapikoni have been presented to all of the presidents. We received the thank you letter signed by all of the presidents, which we don't really like, so we kind of kind of put it in a, <laughs> 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 we never framed it what, but we were still very happy that it had happened and that we had made it. But the story behind the G7, I still want to share because it's, it was a story that political impact and that, you know, the films that we thought we really wanted, to, you know, to tell the world, uh, and I remember everybody being so angry. And, you know, I grew up with a lot of rage, too. I would have loved to have a Wapikoni when I was young and didn't exist. But, uh, and I believe in the power of pride more than rage. I really do believe in the power of pride. And so I told all of the staff, I said, no, but we have 1,200 films, people. We're going to find films that they are ready to hear. They might not even get it, but it's going to, you know, get into their system and slowly educate them. Because I often say, we have a vision as Indigenous people. We know where we should be now. But we also have to work with the reality of where we're at. And to get there, I always say, and that's the first thing I told Temba when I met all of you guys at Berlin Island in November, I said, Wapikoni, we don't have a business model. We have an impact model. We want to change the world. So if we let, say focus on that impact, we have to adapt the message to make sure that it resonates to the audience. So yeah, they didn't take the 12 first films. They were a little too hard for them. So. But within the collection, it was all about our views, our worldviews, our realities. They were all beautiful, our films. Those 12 were not more beautiful or less beautiful. So we found a new program. And we developed it. And we sent it back. And they were extremely happy. And it was all films that had relevance, that talked about missing and murdered, that talked about it in a different way, a little bit less hostile. But it was taken and accepted. And it talked about it. So I think. For me, that's really what Wapikoni is all about. It's all about being able to talk about your pride as, as um, a weapon to exclusion, to marginalization, 
being proud and loud, I often say that, let's be loud and proud, let's dance, let's move, let's cook, let's do whatever we want to do and sh be proud of who we are, not try to be like the others, but share our, our own reality. So that kind of talks to me when I, when I find Wapikoni's experience and how uh, more and more of our people are using the tools. I remember if we look at the collection a long time ago, there was not a lot of elders that were getting involved because of the fear of the camera, because of the historical trauma, because of the people that have come through our communities and stolen images and then they leave with it and they don't come back. They have no conscious of responsibility, community engagement, reciprocity. It doesn't exist. And so there was a lot of fear. But as Wapikoni was developing year after year and as elders were realizing that it was their grandchildren that, that were controlling the camera and the narrative sovereignty, what it's all about and controlling your message. And so more and more the confidence started coming. So we really saw the the, the camera as a tool and a powerful weapon to document, to experiment, to preserve languages, traditions. Uh, for me, Wapikoni in 2020, we also have an urgency to be part of the climate change transition that's going on. And I'm thinking of our relatives that are in Inuit and living in Arctic populations, and they will be the first climatic refugees of this world, and they are our brothers and sisters, and there's an urgency to bring the tools to them so they can document what's going on. We have a film in Wapakoni's collection that's called 47 Names of the Snow. These words will be disappearing in few weir few years. We're gonna be losing these words as we're losing those types of snow because of the melting. So I really believe in the power of the lens, the power of the tool, the power of art to transform, like I said in my introduction, and the journey as much as the destination. For me, that's really important too, that the journey is empowering us. And having delegations like this travel here to Berlin Island, we were privileged, we were uh, meeting so many people, and I feel so privileged to be here with you guys too. And it's empowering us, and it's also getting to know that we have, we are part of a larger collective uh, of people that believe in these same values, and I think that's what's the beauty of all of it. So 15 years in the making, uh, 100 short films done a year, more than 8.5 hours of beautiful indigenous cinema that's being done, and sharing it with other excluded and marginalized voices. So it's really powerful. And this is what we will touch on later on, the sharing with other in, in marginalized and indigenous voices. Um, so you are called Wapikoni Mobile. Um, you're mobile in Canada, working um, across First Nations, Métis and Inuit uh, communities. Um, but you're also mobile globally, so it's a methodology which you, um, I don't use, like to use the word transport, but uh, export, but a methodology which you borrow, which you then, uh, which you share with others. Um, so you've talked about working in Palestine, you've worked with Roma and Sinti communities. Um, yeah, tell us about this form of collaboration which you have with other um, indigenous and marginalized communities across the world. It's, uh, but it's really about believing in social justice through the voices of excluded. You know, that's how we're going to recalibrate privilege, and that's how we're going to have people think about this. So, for example, in Jordan and Palestine, I was in Palestine with the Bedouin community, and it was a group of about 20 youth from, I would say, 10 to 17 years old. Mm -hmm. And we start talking, and I had just met the UN before, saying, I don't understand why you're only using the Geneva Articles to defend human rights here. There's the UN Declaration on Indigenous Issues that could be used as these Bedouins are recognizing the Indigenous UN Declaration. And the UN kind of looked at me and said, huh, we never thought about that. And I'm like, but you guys are the UN. Aren't you supposed to be like the wise people? And so that kind of carried me a little off. But anyways, then I go into the communities and then... I start sharing with them that they are recognized by this UN Declaration, and I start talking about the UN Declaration, and we had just celebrated the 10th anniversary in Canada, even though Canada didn't sign it from the start, but whatever, we were still happy that it existed. A lot of our Canadian Indigenous people had contributed for 20 years in the making of this Declaration, so we were proud of it. And uh, I talked to the group, and I, st and I start telling them that they're indigenous, and they, d they didn't even know they were indigenous. So it's all about the journey of identity. They had no clue they were indigenous. They said, well, no, we're Arab. Our from the start, being indigenous meant they had a specific language. So if they didn't have a specific language, they could not be indigenous. That was their definition. And, I was said, and then I shared my own story of growing up 
uh, in another nation and growing up in urban settings. And I, I too, didn't have my indigenous language, but I was still indigenous. And I said, there's a lot of different ways of identifying identity. So I said, let me share a little bit of my story, like, or a little bit of how we identify in Canada. So I said, in Canada, we don't celebrate marriage like Canadian people do. In Canada, we don't celebrate the passing to the spirit world like Canadian people do. I said, indigenous people, we have our bread. It's sacred. It's as sacred as the baguette for the French people. Our bread, we love our bread. It's bannock and it's delicious. And so, and then they started realizing, oh, we have our coffee. And then I started talking about our songs, our powwows, our, our skirts, our jewelry, our beading. And I started talking about those are my identity symbols. And then they said, oh, well, we have our coffee and we have this. And they started. And so then when I talked about the songs, they all rose and they said, oh, we're going to sing a song to you. And when we work internationally, we always work with somebody that's locally grassrooted in the community. Because in Canada, we can get contact with our communities and band councils and, and community leaders and so on so that we can keep contact with the participants. But internationally, we need to be able to link with an organization that can do that work to make sure that we we continue to inform our participants of what's going on, what's the opportunities. We continue the dialogue and the communications with them. So I have this Palestinian partner, and he says, oh, I'm going to stand up with the kids, and I'll do the song with them, because he's thinking, you know, he's probably going to do this song that I know. And the kids start singing a song that they had learned from their grandmothers. And my Palestinian partnership comes back and sits down, and he says, I didn't understand a thing they said. It's not Arab. And I just turned around and I said, you know what? It's not Arab. And it was the first time they realized that they were repeating a song from their grandmothers from a language that was theirs. And they did not realize this. They were 7 to 16 years old going through colonization. That's crazy now. They did not even realize that they had a language. And then I started talking about narrative sovereignty. Because narrative sovereignty is extremely important in this methodology. It's all about controlling your message, doing it the way you want to do it. And I said, I know you guys are going through a whole lot of rage and a whole lot of <laughs> anger, and you can do films on whatever you want. So if you want to do anti-Israeli films, do anti-Israeli films. Nobody's going to tell you not to do it. But one of the things that I realized through Wapikoni and through my own journey is that when you, when you work on your pride, you empower yourself, and your message passes a lot easier in a lot of things. You can do it on what you want, but I just started sharing a few Wapakoni films, and uh, that journey, like I said, the journey is as important as the destination. I often say I have two boys, one's 19, one's 12. And I know this decolonization process and this indigenizing our own structures, because we're going through that in our own country. and. It's going to take generations. And if I want to inspire my kids to take that, you know, fight on in the future generations, they need to see me smile. They need to see me have fun. They need to see me celebrate all of the small steps that I'm making. Because if not, they're not going to want to take that fight on after me. So I often say we have that vision, but we have to deconstruct it in these small little steps, and we need to celebrate each little step that we're achieving together so we inspire our youth to continue that fight with us. And that, for me, is extremely important in the way and the methodology. And that's what I shared with them. And I said, you know, but you do it on what you want. The healing process might also mean anger and rage and do it like that if that's what you need. But just remember the power of also the positive, being proud of your identity, being proud of who you are. That's also extremely empowering. Four months later, we got the films back. They had made six films in five weeks. One of them was called Education in Time of Demolition, and it was extremely powerful about the demolition of Israeli people on their community. And for them was about their culture, their living lives, their horses, their coffee. It was extremely beautiful and powerful. So I really believe in that journey. And I know that you come out of that with power because you're like celebrating. And one of the things we always do after a, a stopover is that we have a gathering. We share, and it's sometimes the first time that these young people address their community leadership with their vision, their values, their struggles, their priorities. So it's the first contact. So it starts by creating community links, 
And then these films, what we do, Tanya is head of distribution at Wapikoni, and I always say, like, there are three girls at Wapikoni, and they work and they submit about five, <laughs> 6,000 films a year in everywhere. All festivals, all conferences, all indigenous content, all human rights, environmental, everywhere. They submit thousands and thousands of films. And we get about three, 400 yeses. And we celebrate those yeses. And we don't care about the 4,500 no's. You know? We're really celebrating the yeses and making sure we develop these delegations so that we go to those spots. But we also developed our own distribution initiatives because we believe in the power of proximity. We believe that the films need to be w in the original spaces of gatherings of the citizens. We have to go where they are. So a little bit like I said about the G7 event, but we do it in different forms. We have our cinema on wheels, so we go traveling all over and we offer cinema outdoor. We have our bikes, projector bikes, that I hope you'll all be seeing in 2020 in this area. I'm working hard on developing that. And that's in parks and proximity with your children. And then you could share and see the films and then you could have discussions with people that understand these films in the, b in the background and the information so you could have topics and discussions because I believe in collectives. Mm -hmm. I believe in discussion. I believe in the power of unity, togetherness. I think that's how we got to do it, and it's by sharing. A lot of people come to me and say, hi, Adzel, how do I do partnerships with indigenous people? Because we have a whole lot of programs now. If you partner with an indigenous thing, you get money. So they're like, okay, I need money. I want to do my project. How do I partner? <laughs> and they do that a lot, you know, because they want to access those programs, you know, these new reconciliation programs. And so I often say, you know, but for me, partner Partnership is friendship, it's relations. I will not be your partner if I don't know your values. I will not be your partner if I don't know you care. I will not be your partner if you don't come to my party. You know, it's, for me it's the same thing. Come to my party, I'll go to your party and we might develop a partnership. So for me that's also extremely important to understand that partnership is not a contractual agreement. Partnership is a human relationship. It takes time, it takes sharing, it takes spaces to share, and it's really, really important. Same thing about privilege. I was talking about privilege, and that's really a hot topic. And we're talking a lot about that in uh, Canada, privilege. And, and one of the things that kind of shook me once is my son. He was uh, in fifth grade. And he was talking about his favorite candies. He loves Skittles, and it's this little bag of Skittles, and maybe 30 or some little candies in it. And he always shared them with his four friends. You know, he shared his pack of Skittles with his four friends. And one day he came back from school and he said, hi, there's this new person in school and he's really cool and now he's part of the team, he's part of the gang and I really like, and he said he was so happy when I shared my Skittles. And I realized that he had never come back to me and asked me for a second pack of Skittles because he had a new friend. So that means that sharing does not mean you need more. A lot of people say, well, I do want to, you know, integrate diversity, but I need more resources. No, you don't. You do not need more resources. You just need to refocus. My son never asked me for an extra pack of Skittles, but he welcomed a fifth partner in the crew because he wanted to, because he loved them. So I often say to people, recalibrating privilege has nothing to do with having or needing more. It's having to do with refocusing, reintegrating people. Because I was very pissed, uh, sorry, uh, about a few comments of big, big cultural institutions in Canada where they said, well, yeah, yeah, I really do want to do an indigenous theater, but I need $5 million more. And if I don't get $5 million, I can't do it. And I need this. And, and that, that for me is a challenging topic. And we need to continue challenging that because, no, it's not true. You do not need more resources. And you need to demonstrate your capacity of doing it correctly doing it ethically, and really building those friendships and relationships. Thank you. <laughs> so over the past months, I've been working um, with a Chilean uh, Mapuche filmmaker and uh, festival director, Janet Payan. Um, we, bought, we realized that we both knew Odile, and we um, discussed Odile and gave Odile a nickname, which is Fuego fire in Spanish. And so, yeah, Odile has fuego. Odile is fuego. Um, 
Oh, do you touched on some of the, um, you know, this concept of indigeneity and um, who defines indigeneity? What's the US, UN's definition of indigeneity? Um, how do we self-identify as being indigenous? I think this is the point where, Fanny, you can join us also. Fantastic. Um, so yes, you gave us the anecdote on the Bedouin people of, of Palestine and um, in my work, so I'm in charge of diversity inclusion at the European film market. Um, I'm also um, working as indigenous cinema coordinator for the native indigenous cinema stand, which is a um, stand at the European film market, which is uh, run by Imaginative. It's um, the largest indigenous-led film festival in the world based in Canada. This, this concept of indigenous-led is very important um, because as, as Odile said, it's a question of narrative sovereignty and so many films have been made about indigenous people, not with them, not, not, not collaboratively with them, with perspectives which are others. And so um, imaginative, imaginative is, is foregrounding that concept um, and has done that for the past 20 years. Um, and so I have been working um, with several indigenous organizations, um, Imaginative, I've been working with Wapikoni, of course, um, with the New Zealand Film Commission, with their indigenous department, with several across the world. Um, and it's been a very um, fascinating, illuminating experience being somebody who's also from a colonized, um, from colonized peoples. My background is I'm British, but um, I'm half Jamaican and half Zimbabwean. My ancestors from Zimbabwe came from KwaZulu-Natal in South Africa 150 years ago. And so when I go into those spaces, my, my work has a different aspect to it. It has a, a, an aspect of solidarity because essentially what we're doing is we're creating spaces um, as platforms for discussions, for conversations, for empowerment, um, which goes beyond the job description of diversity and inclusion. Um, and so quite often those spaces become spaces of advocacy also. So um, today we had Claudio Hakimia, um, who was on the first panel, Leo Pacarati, um, at the European Film Market, she is the country in focus um, this year. And so part of my work has been to um, ensure that within the country in focus format of Chile at the European Film Market, which is a film market with industry platforms, but that we try and ensure um, that indigenous voices and perspectives are, are, are maintained within that focus, within that celebration of Chilean identity, that this is, they're still there as a slice of the pie. Um, and so yesterday we organized the Pan at the Chilean Embassy, which um, it was obviously about reframing those voices, including them within a general conversation, but it also took on the aspect of an exercise in advocacy um, on behalf of these indigenous voices. And quite often I find myself in a position where I'm using my um, my privilege, my global north privilege, um, in order to be a vehicle for these conversations. Um, the second aspect of this is that as a colonized person, a person from a colonized background, let's say, um, quite often I'm asked to relate my background within these indigenous circles. And so um, that's brought on a questioning of as to what's my relationship to indigeneity? Am I perhaps indigenous on uh, my father's side from Zimbabwe? and? Um, South Africa and an interest in the way in which this term of indigenous has been um, claimed in um, in the African continent. If we um, look perhaps in, even in Zimbabwe, which is perhaps a negative example, but a quite an interesting example, um, under Mugabe, um, there was a law which was, which was voted in um, that uh, businesses which were white owned or owned by non-Zimbabweans would be indigenized, right? They would be purchased um, up to 51% by the state. And so it's very much like this term, how it's used. Um, within the African context, there's the, the question of indigenous languages, Zulu, or Kosa, Indibeli, all of these indigenous languages within Southern Africa. And so who can claim that term in Africa is basically my question. Um, and how does that term scan and relate to the African um, continent? And I think one very interesting example, and Tiny, looking to you, Ketty Wen, looking to you also, Yolanda, looking to you also too. Um, so we have a cohort of um, South African film professionals with us today. Um, in South Africa, there's a very interesting case which Odile knows um, also quite well. Um, so the one-on-one -on -one of South African 
migrational history, let's say, and I'll hand the mic over to you, um, is that you know, the first peoples of South Africa were the Khoikhoi or the Khoisan peoples, and then the Bantu peoples, so my peoples, came from West Africa um, and moved in a migrational wave that roughly 600 years ago. And so um, our peoples, to some extent, absorbed those peoples who were there, so that's why we still have cliques in our languages like Osa and Indibeli and Zulu, um, to a great extent, but then those peoples still existed there. So now, um, we have a debate in South Africa around this concept of indigeneity. Um, who's indigenous in South Africa? Are, are Zulus, Indibeli, Kosas, Sutus, and so forth, are they indigenous peoples um, who have their own indigenous languages, or are um, the only true indigenous peoples um, the original inhabitants? Um, and because I don't feel legitimate to talk about this particular topic, because I'm not from the contemporary version of South Africa, I would like to hand over to one of you three. Um, neither am I, but I'm, I'm, I, I'm, I'm not going to be held back. Um, <laughs> no, I, I think one of the things that I think that, uh, that we, we have to contend with, with within our context in South Africa is that... Um, the sorry we, we we have to contend with within our context is that um, in 1884 I think in this city um, our continent was divided and that division was not our division um, before these divisions we the, the, I, I'm not sure how far down we came but there was free movement in various areas. So if we, as people who lived in the, in the northwest or the northeast, moved down into the south, um, that was part of the continent. And so as much as the colonial um, holders of power um, in the last 600 years have created, or 400 years, created um, divisions in the sense that um, the, the Khoi and the Sun were stripped even more than um, other indigenous people of their rights. Um, and when we, when when independence came, um, as Africans, we did not necessarily re um, give restitution back to those stripped rights. There has been a, a continuation of um, that's a very good word uh, of marginalisation of the Khoi and the Sun. Um, and so, so I'm not sure where that responsibility lies. I think it lies in the erasure of our memories which are made true through, um, th through the way in which history has been depicted rather than the truth. So I, I, I do not believe that, um, that we, have, we are part of, of, of the destruction of the Khoi and the Sun because their languages are part of Kosa. Uh, Kosa, the, you know, the, the, the Khoi and the Sun have very big cliques. So, yeah. So w those languages have been in, embedded in, in Guni languages um, so I'm not sure how responsible we are for the erasure of the indigenous people of the very south, but I am indigenous and my people are indigenous of the continent. So I, 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 want, I, want, to, I want to not be responsible for what happened to the Khoi and the Sun. I take responsibility now as a 
contemporary South African that we have not restored those rights in adequate ways, but I don't take it further than that. Um, I think for me, and um, I have those features where I always think that I do come from the koi and and the sun. I think there's one thing, right? You divide. Um, South Africa has been into democracy for the past 25 years, and after that democracy, there was what um, is the official languages and the official cultures that we take forward. And yes, maybe we may not personally be responsible um, for the erasure um, or the past erasure of the Khoi people. But I think as a nation now or as the, as, as, as the government now, which is the black government, we are responsible for the continuous erasure and the extinction of the Khoi and the Sun people as it is right now, because if you look at it, they are currently marginalized. They are um, things that are put in place in terms of how to reserve the other cultures, um, cultures which may be emanating from the Khoi and may be emanating from the Sun, but the fact that we can claim today to be Kosa and fully say that we do come from the Khoi, but actually not do anything actively to actually reserve and preserve that where we say we come from, we then are in a way partly um, continue to enable the erosion of the, I suppose, the indigenous people. So it's a, I think it's a two part. Um, and I think we have to own that as um, as the people that do have the voices today, as people that um, um, I suppose are responsible for the next um, years and the next cultures. I mean, right about now, there are languages that have in the Khoi communities and the San communities that have been have come into an extension in the past 15 years, and we cannot honestly say that we're not responsible because we are here, what are we actively doing? Um, so in a way, you, you almost say, yes, I'm not responsible for yesterday, but I'm completely responsible for today. And I saw so many um, like similarities even in the, in, in the films that we were watching in terms of um, like you look, you look at the cultures that we have adopted as our own and how much they adopt and take from the from the Khoi people, uh, I don't want to say indigenous because maybe we're all indigenous, but we have the voice, we have the privilege of being able to preserve our cultures, but not so much the Khoi and the Sun, who were the first nation in the southern region of South Africa. So it's almost like the, we, the privilege that comes with us, what makes a difference from what makes it different from the other people that have been privileged before us, whether it be um, people of different colors or people who actually were part of the uh, of dividing us and destroying um, our cultures and everything. So that's just I think I I hear you, but I kind of like differ with you at some point. So I, I guess my contribution is that. I'm wary of this discussion in the South African context because um, I think part of the method of like the colonial power is to create boxes and put people in those boxes as a way to control those people, um, to control movement, to control the possibilities for cultural exchange, but also to limit the possibilities for solidarity. I think in South Africa, this is it's well documented how that was institutionalized. Um, the South African um, system for oppression apartheid created a hierarchy uh, of um, 
of existence for all peoples. And the Khoisan existed somewhere within that hierarchy. Bantu people existed somewhere within that hierarchy. Mixed race people existed somewhere with that hierarchy, within that hierarchy. Um, indentured laborers would come in um, maybe 150 years ago into South Africa from India existed somewhere with that, within that hierarchy. Those, um, those people migrating from India from at least 150 years ago had their own hierarchy within the case system of India that plays itself out within um, South Africa. And because this hierarchy was also directly linked to material survival, um, we all hold on to those hierarchies. I think that there's a way that all of us from wherever in the global south we come from, we can find similar comparison about how colonial power enters and creates this hierarchy, even within um, Native American communities, there was, you know, a slave population that came in, and there's, there's those, there's all of those, and I think what's interesting about this gathering is this magical possibility for solidarity. Uh, just, just, just one thing, just about, about. Can I just say one thing about the, 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 the there was a dance right in the beginning um, with the shells and the whistles and the movement, and it's exactly, exactly the same as the, sh the, the movement which uh, the Bedi have, where they have a whistle, um, it's a very high-pitched whistle, and they, they don the very same shells on the ankles, and the same kind of movement, it is exactly the same, it's amazing. I, I think in the term indigenous as a mm, some t in some context more like a political term than anything else. For example, if you we compare with the um, I, I, uh, for example, indigenous in Brazil or in Guinea, uh, the so-called indigenous in Guinea, so there is no possible comparison. Once uh, we live in our country, we rule that country as ourselves. Uh, for example, I don't belong to any ethnic group in Guinea Bissau, but I was born there. Nice. So I am an indigenous <laughs> in, in, in that sense of term. I was from there, from that land. Uh, but uh, as I don't have any ethnic group also, it's like a well, uh, I, I, no one never said I don't belong. But uh, if you consider from the, I'm going to say this word, white people point of view, it's like uh, we are indigenous because we live with the land. We have this tradition that we practice. So that makes us indigenous. For example, uh, last year, uh, some people from EU or UN they were they went there in Guinea Bissau. They organized a lot of group of people to make a video. Everyone come and say, uh, "My name, uh, I am from Fula. I am indigenous. I am Manding. I am indigenous." And the main problem is indigenous in Guinea Bissau is a derogative term. Yeah, we use that. We if avoid that term because he's offensive. So this guy, they don't know anything about the country, uh, anything about the people, and they just come and because they got some funding from somewhere else yeah. to make people act stupid. And uh, well, they pay, we act stupid. Yeah. Thank you, I mean, I think this, um, reflects especially the South African example of the use of the term indigeneity um, and especially what you were saying tiny um, I was thinking the same thing along the lines of South Africa is an, is an extreme example of institutionalized identities and those being um, used in hierarchy and this debate uh, as it's reappeared in South Africa again kind of um, recast that hierarchy between um, two sets of indigenous identities in a country where all identities were hierarchized not so long ago. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's, it's a very delicate, touchy debate. It's a debate with, you know, you ask yourself, what's the objective of this final debate? Um, could, could it be recast in a different sense that all, all yeah, exactly, what's the utility? Um, 
There are obviously uh, other areas of the world in which there are um, identities which are not necessarily as um, formalized as they were in South Africa, but which with several other identities, with uh, colorism and so on and so forth, um, turning our attention perhaps to uh, Central America, in particular to Fanny Hook. Um, we had a very um, interesting conversation earlier on which um, reflected the gentleman's comments there on um, the term indigenous, uh, indigena in Spanish, um, and in Spanish, you have several terms now to describe. Um, in French, you can say autochton. In Spanish, you can say indigena. You can say pueblos originarios, aborigenes. All of these terms which exist. And so we had a very interesting um, discussion on how, the, how those terms scan differently in your context. Um, could you walk us through that? It's very interesting that you pointed out. And I don't want to make this a long conversation. I, I think I have a very clear vision of the um, context of all of our communities in in this situation. When the Spanish came to conquer Panamanian territory and American continent, they were looking for India. So <laughs> this is a true fact, and this is registered in their own archives. And that's why we inherited the term indigenous. So indigenous people from where I come from don't use that term to define themselves. We were already there, and that's not the name that we call our own people. So because nobody was there to call it the way it was, and because there were so many languages, which I connect so much with the situation in South Africa, it's not a responsibility for whoever is telling the story now. Is a responsibility who, uh, of who erased it in the first place. Because we uh, are not able to go back and talk the language that we were supposed to talk. There were multiple countries. I am about to turn 40 only. And when I was growing up, I learned nine tribes in my little country. There has been multiple families that ended up being tribes and that had their own language, and that had their own methodology of existing. Colonization disturbed all that. And now we feel responsible for it because we can't sustain that story, because we are unable to remember something that we didn't live. So this conversation is very nurturing for the fact that we can recognize that we are not responsible for what happened. We are victims of it, and our diligence is to find ways to find that story and link our present to our past and look within ourselves where, how do we want to be defined? I do not want to be called indigenous because I am not from India. I was never, that. there is no relation and I don't know if etymologically there is a connection with the name indigenous and aboriginal or originary or whatever, um, but I know there is a relationship between what the Spanish were looking for and what they found. And what was there is still there. We are still the owners of that land. Nobody can call us something we don't wanna be called. But we need to find out how we wanna be called. I, I'm very fond of Wapikoni um, work. I have programmed Wapikoni projects in the past in the spaces that I am able to do so. And I encourage everybody here that has a space to discuss our heritage individually to do so, because nobody else can. And there will be propaganda to do so. It exists already. So the responsibility is not about, it's not ours, is the extractivism model that persists. There is a reason why we continue to think in a certain way, because we are constantly fed with this idea of what we should be so that we stay quiet and we don't tell about what is happening in our communities separately. But at the end is the same. There is a resource from a very healthy and prosperous and nutritive continents that has been extracted and taken somewhere else. Everybody knows where. Everybody knows how, <laughs> and we know how we use it because we are part of that structure as well. But we cannot deny 
that that is the reason why we don't know exactly why or how or when we lost our identity. We just need to find it out and discuss it. Thank you. I mean, the question is also, did we lose our identity completely? And if you, yeah, continue. It depends, because there are multiple spaces where, we're, where we are resistant in fighting that. There are multiple. There, also, there is also a numbness to it, an apathy around it, because social media is uh, a world of information. And it's, we have come to a, a moment where we don't three-point and um, investigate where our facts are coming from. We just read something and we think, oh, this had to be true, it was in CNN. <laughs> we don't double check our facts, we don't investigate, we don't have critical analysis of what we've seen. We just believe immediately. So who is resistant and who is acknowledging? I don't think we have lost our identity. I think there are groups of people they're taking advantage of the mess around the confusion. And there are groups of people that feel fading. Like, I'm gonna pe put my personal example. I am from Panama. Panama is a highly colonized country that consistently has creative ways to sell the uh, privacy and the extract extractivism model into new and exciting fun ways. <laughs> the Panama Canal is a one of those. The Panama Canal is a, a huge asset. Every ship that goes by the Panama Canal every day, which is, it can go to 100 a, a day, pays around $100,000 $100, to go through. Whatever it is in those containers has a measurement amount called TEU. Do you know what that is? Neither do I. <laughs> <laughs> so they, they're describing whatever goes in there because they can't compare oranges to iPhones. So whatever is in that container has a different value. But just going through is a value already. Why are we poor? Why is my country so, there, how, why is there so much inequity? The indigenous people that Wapikoni visited, the Embera tribe in the northeast region, were moved from their land to a different land because of a, um, ¿cómo se dice represa? Represa. The dam, a dam one that gives energy to most of the country. So the rest of us were like, oh, yeah, it's a dumb, oh, well, but it's, it's really a lot of lights at night and Christmas, so we like it. And they had to move. They went to this other side of the country where they didn't know anything, where they didn't grow anything, where they had to share with another tribe called Kunas that are not related whatsoever and they were at the beginning of the road. So for the Embera to get to their communities, they have to go through the Gunas, which is very disturbing. And they are now facing logging and gentrification again. And it, it's a nonstop process. We have 121 dam licitations in three rivers on the north where all of our harvest is coming from. We have a project of at thousand or some hectares, I don't know how to say that in English either, it's like eso, um, <laughs> to develop a new lake to feed the canal for water to operate. But we are facing a water crisis because even though we are in the midst of two gigantic oceans, those are not drinkable water. But how do we celebrate carnival right now as we speak? pouring water. It's our tradition to pour water in carnival. So it's important to keep people numb, to people, people disconnected, to keep people not communicating about why are we going again to these traditions? Why do we do it? 
because it's convenient for the extractivism model that we are getting benefit as well. So um, it's, a dis it's a very sensitive discussion because we all want to survive. So it's a surviving model. Once we got disturbed by the conquest, everything was messed up, and we are trying to bring all the pieces back together into something that will never be what it was. So we cannot reconstruct a cultural heritage that is gone. It's gone. Foo. Fuera. Fue. I hate to say it, that I would love to go back to the nine Aboriginal tribes that we met, once met, but that's not going to happen. I am a result of a bunch of tribes and blacks and whites and all of that, and I will not refuse that heritage. This is what I am, and I can reconstruct my country and take ownership of my resources for my people. And we are not going to stop the fight in every way we can. It's going to be audiovisual. It's going to be in the streets. I did to Gloria, felt it when these people were in the street because we are right now also in the streets stopping our government to make amendments on our constitution to mine, to destroy, to f sell all of our resources. The, uh, it's very disturbing to accept that somebody else will have that benefit stored in a cabinet. It's not even that they are needing it more than us because these communities have no running water, these communities have no energy, these communities have no food, these communities live in coupons. Some of them, don't, we don't have coupons, come on. I'm from Central America, we don't know what that is. We plant whatever we wanna eat and if it doesn't grow, nah, nah, good luck, try some cereal. We do have diabetes, we do have the same issues. Everybody's facing the same because we need to acknowledge that the land is for us to produce and survive. It's not for others to sell and make a profit out of. And whenever we take uh, that into a serious action, we're not gonna see a change. Yeah. Thank you. Um, there's um, something you asked earlier, which is, have we lost our cultures? Another experience that we must acknowledge is that part of the colonial process was about imposing cultural identities. So they would send anthropologists throughout the whole of the continent after the conference, and they would say, this is how the Zulus dress. This is the cultures of the, these are the traditions of the Zulus. And these are part of those traditions that we want to preserve because it is strategically important. And these are the parts of the cultures that we want to erase because also it's strategically important. So as a result, a lot of identities within our cultures were erased, including queer identity. So now, so now it's impossible for us to talk about our cultures without coming into some sort of conflict. Again, part of this process of manufacturing this identity and keeping people in these specific kinds of boxes. So I'm also very interested in talking about our indigeneity into the future. And what can we reclaim from what was taken away, but also what do we need to evolve so we can live happier lives as people who are proud of our identity, but also people who are owning and claiming the future and not holding a space, right, for colonial power. What do we preserve? And what do we reclaim also? I think Tiny, you touched on a very interesting point, which is, um, yes, there was so much lost, especially in terms of ad ancestral practices, in terms of, um, let's that, say, this new term, multiplicity, uh, gender, identity, sexual, or, uh, identities around sexual orientation, and so on and so forth. And what we're seeing in the film world is, you know, what you can call broadly decolonial film, but you're seeing this resurgence of um, these identities being claimed, um, the two-spirit identity in the indigenous world. Um, these uh, identities being, there was a, 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 a film, there was a project at Durban Film Art, which was specifically about this from, um, from the RDC, um, about uh, a, a trans identity, um, which was completely 
um, erased and completely oppressed uh, when the Belgians arrived. And so it's, we're seeing kind of these, these um, commonalities, let's say, this panel's about commonalities and, 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 al and alliances. And I think that, that you know, we now have as Afro-descended people, as Africans, as indigenous peoples, this um, amazing opportunity to share these commonalities and create spaces in which they can be shared and find those parallels. Um, Again, from my perspective as an Afro-descended person working within um, this context, I've, what I've been seeing quite often um, in, in Latin America is seeing contexts where you have um, indigenous film festivals which now have an editorial arm which is indigenous and Af Afro-descended. Or they have um, capacity building um, schemes, again to refer to Janet Payan who has a, um, a capacity building scheme called the Mapu Lab which works with young Mapuche other indigenous and Afro-descended filmmakers from across Latin America. Um, she also organizes a um, artistic residency called FILC, which does the same thing. It's an artistic residency for Mapuche, indigenous, and Afro-descended peoples from across Latin America. So we're seeing these alliances, which are based in this common history, which is, you know, the, the inception of that history is these people who are looking for India, Christopher Columbus, and so on and so forth. Um, so. My question to all of you is, from this commonality, from beyond the definition of who is indigenous and not indigenous, how can we open this space and make this a space, a, a shared space where we can, you know, we used the term before, um, decolonization and excellence to describe Wapikoni, which is what we saw on the screen, decolonization and excellence. So how can we do excellent decolonization together and collaboratively? I have one thing to say before you get that mic. Uh, I know it's harsh to say that whatever existed might not longer be the same, but whatever does exist needs to be preserved. We'll talk about syncretism. It needs to be preserved in, in the original way that it was, well, the ways that we remember it, because there is no accuracy to it. But one of the ways is by sharing that with the ones that have that information. In my country, some of the tribes live very far. It's hours walking. And that's why they are preserved, because it's very hard to get to these places. So cinema, discussions, conversations, aids, all of that needs to get there. Nothing, it's not the same if we discuss this here without who, the people that own the information still, the oral legacy. I have a good example about a community called Kiev that I visited six hours walking in Panama. They have been disturbed multiple times. They have moved over the years, centuries ago, 100 years ago. And I met this man that made a new alphabet. He said to me, we have been communicated orally for years. I'm afraid that if I die, my heritage will be faded. So I invented this alphabet that I'm gonna share with my kids and my grandsons and my great grandsons so they can remember my tales and my, the story of my, my heritage and they can tell it in the future to their descendants. Uh, he has created, this is so hard for me to digest, but also so encouraging that once you're oppressed and erased and burned and killed, you can still survive and make yourself up again. Invent a new legacy, a new way to share that legacy. So there are things that we do need to preserve there are people that still need to be rescued from this idea that colonization is beneficial. The progress will um, somehow make them better. That the resources are exchangeable for money. These ideas need to be there because there is also a lot of necessity. So this is the reason why they sell the land. This is the reason why they uh, approved the exchange of $3,000 for their land. This is a true case. People, men and women have accepted, uh, accepted $3,000 for their land, for them to move from these communities that their hydroelectrical projects are being built on. So 
yes, I feel that there is something to be done. It's not everything erased because colonization just messed or a structure from the very inside. There is still some resistance that is productive and that can over, be overcome. But we need to communicate better. And the challenge is how do we go about taking this information into the context of the people that really need to learn it? Not discuss it in the huge Berlinale or in Panama Film Festival or in the other platforms that might not be um, digested uh, for the people that need to digest it. And then project that to the rest so that we can have empathy to what's going on and not feel like that's something happening over there in the mountains that has nothing to do with me because climate change, the situation in Brazil, affects everybody all the way to Africa. African uh, sub-Saharan um, waves of sand affect Panama. And the way the water moves in Panama affects the states. And the way the Arctic is melting affects Chile. So everything is connected and the sooner we discuss how we're gonna do this together, the better. It's gonna be really hard and it's gonna take a lot of centuries, a lot of heritage, it's gonna take a lot of families, it's gonna take the history of all of us to actually see some uh, results. But it can be done and the life will persist is how do we want our heritage to live? Do we want them to live like we do now? Or do we want them to live like they did before? It's a, it's a question that we, we need to uh, answer or, ourselves. And then take that mic. <laughs> um, if I may add something, and I think I'm probably echoing a lot of what has been said before, but I wanted to, um, to connect what Tiny said and what uh, Fanny just said in terms of the necessity to, to retrospect and to prospect, which to me, in some way, is at least from a subjective perspective, is at the core of this conversation. So even in the definition of indigeneity lies, um, so working, it was a guy from Guyana, called Ivan van Setima, who wrote a book called They Came Before Columbus. And it was very important because it was very necessary in the time. He was a, he was a student of Sheikh Anta Diop. It was very important for him to make a narrative that is not limited to a forced displacement because a lot of what we're talking about now has to do with displacement. Force or normal, willing, you know, people move. So he said, there are people that left the African continent and went to the Americas long before the Middle Passage. Yes. Now, so I think this is very important in understanding the way societies have been created, mm. you know, and the way we find ourselves in these spaces today. Now, so we shouldn't reduce that to those certain narratives. On the other hand, and I think this is important, and I think you mentioned that it, somewhere in the beginning, which was the impossibility of being non-indigenous, for example, on the African continent. I mean, I cannot see how I cannot be indigenous on the African continent, even if it doesn't exist in language. Okay, now, which is to say, you cannot take, again, the multiplicity of beings from narratives of indigeneity. So indigeneity cannot be reduced to one thing, or one kind of being, and so on and so forth. So it has to be always a multiplicity of beings. Now, I want to, to situate this a bit. There's a Malian um, uh, philosopher, Amadou Ambateba, who wrote about the notion of personhood in Bambara Cosmogony and Pearl Cosmogony. 
Now, this is very important because he says, he talks about the complexity of personhood. You are always multiple. Now, this is echoed a couple of years later in what Glisson writes about the consent not to be a single being. In this interview he does with, with, with Manche Jawara. And now, what is important about this is that he says, besides the displacement that happens of Africans going to somewhere else, Africans have always been moving on the continent. So in indigeneity, we must take into consideration various forms of displacement, forced or, right? So this is what I want to put into the, into, in, uh, in, in, the, in, in the discussion, you know, which I find very important, you know. So, you know, um, you know so something we talk about a lot at Savi, uh, you know, when uh, 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 Boaventura de Souza Santos talks about, you know, the epistemicide, the destruction of a set of, of knowledge systems. So we have to work towards the recovery of certain knowledge systems that have been destroyed. And the production, that's why I find the example you gave very important of new languages, new alphabets, new structures that will actually define us the way we want to be defined. That's it. Now, I think to move to the next level from this point of view is how this informs aesthetic and forms. How do the films we make, the art we make, the spaces we create, like Savi, you know, the kind of structure, the societies we create, how are they informed by this retrospection and the prospection? That's my question. I have a few notes. I have a few notes on that. It is registered that black uh, heritage was in the American continent before the coloni colonial days. However, the way the extractivism model and the oppression uh, and the dynamics that happened between the black people that existed, and not only them, but the Chinese people that were already before uh, Columbus in the American continent as well. That's why we have such a strong Chinese heritage in my uh, continent, goes to prove that the dynamic of the oppression of the conquest is different than the um, movement of nomads, uh, which is a quality of our tribes and most of tribes everywhere around it, and goes to uh, agree with your Aboriginal uh, definition. What makes somebody originary? What makes somebody origin origin uh, originario? No sé cómo decir eso, Ana. But um, what does need to be preserved? What, would this, what was destroyed? Because some of the legacy that dates back from the early black interactions with indigenous, at least in my country, perceives, persists. And a good example is the Congo uh, community heritage that we, I was sharing with you before. It's a carnival. It's a heritage that we continue to do is an interaction that happens within black people that were un enslaved and it's known to be um, a movement of resistance that happened and that existed probably before because black communities and indigenous communities were living together in Panama before. We don't have proof, we don't have records, we don't know how, how that healthy relationship existed and that's what we want to bring back, not the extractivism model, not the destroyment, not the uh, uh, usement of or resources in the benefit of somebody else and destroying the benefit of, of whoever is still there. Mm -hmm. That is something, and about the creation of new languages and new strategies and new dialogues, to me it's all about investigation. Who created the peace? Do we know each enough about that peace, about Savi? What is the art in that gallery? Who made it? What is the motivation of this person? It's not only about how pretty it is or how trendy it is. It's why is this person talking about this subject? Does he know enough? Was he being there? Is he telling the story that these people want to communicate? Or is just a trend? So it's a responsibility of whoever is 
looking at that piece, looking at that film, looking at that art, to be informed and ask the questions of the motivation and, and, and of the, the story of these people other than just the person that is putting it out there because it might have enough connections but not connections with these real people that are being portrayed if it's not them that are doing it. Um, it was a bit uh, far from that, but uh, it kind of uh, resonates actually uh, more and more, and, and, and I think about it. I really like what you said and what you said too. And um, I think uh, in, the, uh, in my nation, actually, uh, we talk, you know, in my, in my country, they always uh, uh, name the, n the nation differently that they are naming themselves. And uh, in my nation, uh, they, they call us Adikmuk, but we are Nerizio, which means the one who adapted themselves uh, on the land, of, of the environment. So, um, and I think it, it might resonate. Actually, it's like, uh, um, it's like the word indigenous, not indigenous, but <laughs> it's like the word native. Because you, now you're adapting yourself up on the environment that you are, and not uh, in the society. That is some completely different thing. And uh, I think uh, um, uh which means indigenous, uh, we have to uh, adapt ourselves of the environment that we will live, and that is also maybe adapting uh, ourselves on the on the. Uh, Technology that we had to 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 take roots on 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 the land, and uh, that mean uh, like the the nar narrative sovereignty. That means the 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 cameras and and taking the, uh, that place that remains to us to speak up, and uh, and this talking stick, <laughs> and um, yeah, I and I, I'm. Remember, actually, uh, one of the m movie that we had uh, in uh, Wapikoni that said that uh, it's um, we had to we had to make focus on education, but not only education as Caucasian made, education also as grandparents made, education as a brother and sister made, uh, as a hunt as a woman as a as a father and um, and it, it's important now to, to 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 pass this knowledge that you have and uh, this is how actually a really um, a really good good uh, uh, filmmaker that said once in in one of the movie that a friend of, of him said that uh, youth of today are the ancestors of tomorrow, mm -hmm. and this is and we we said that always like leaders are now are now youth are the leaders of tomorrow. No, leaders are now youth are the leaders of today, but youth are the ancestors of tomorrow, and we have to take this responsibility to just teach back now our, our knowledge. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to take us back in further in terms of, of history of humanity and um, to talk about um, where, where we have been sourced to say that we came from. Mm -hmm. And there was a woman somewhere in mid-central Africa um, towards the east, make, I always get this wrong and I can't say it properly. Matri Macrochondrical Eve, I can't say it. <laughs> anyway, she, she, she was this woman who is the mother of all humanity. And we all came from her. So if we all came from her, we all moved on this planet. And we moved to these various places on the planet. 
so I think what we have to, to, to start to defend is that movement and change is part of the human condition and what is happening in terms of, of um, this notion of, of, well, this thing that we're seeing, which is, which is uh, so it's such an anathema, is, is allowing people to drown in the, um, between Europe and Africa because there is a perception that we are invaders and that we, and if we go back, who are the people who crossed um, from Yemen, from Yemen to uh, the east, from the east m over to the wards Europe, from Europe over towards the, so these peoples were all Africans. We were all moved. So I think we have to, we, we have to be able to, to, to take the discourse away, away from us being unchanging because the nature of humanity is change, is movement, is growth, is, uh, but we also, there is a need so there's, there's, I'm, I'm almost arguing two different things at the same time. I'm not sure if that's possible. Uh, but if, if, it, if, if, you, if you have this notion of your culture, it's really important that we keep cultures and we keep difference alive in that, in that we need to give our children something. Okay. However, it's also important to embrace change and to embrace that nothing is static and that we move and we've tra traversed and we've moved around the globe and we are one people and we are not different. It is history and interpretation that has made us different and not um, what we really are. Uh, there, there is just, for example, this thing of uh, we insist in immutability in a world in constant transformation. That's so stupid from us all. Uh, for example, uh, if you see, um, I'm gonna Africa is a European project. Mm. They they came, they make the border. We fought, we got the independence, we kept the border. And we kept the language. Mm. We still speak in French, English, Portuguese in our country. So we're still doing what they want. Uh, I think the, the, the way to change this is to, to there's three, three points. Religion, God is white. And uh, God made the, 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 the man uh, uh, from his image. So when a black person look at white men, uh, f uh, this white man is closer to God than him because God made the man at his own image and the God is white, blonde, blue eyes. Nice. True German. Um, and there's the, this knowledge, the education, uh, the academic, universities. We go to university to study Western philosophy. What about African philosophy? If you, we don't change the, the education, we, if you don't change the, the studies, uh, they, uh, if you're studying uh, uh, European university, Western university uh, philosophy, they had uh, 22,000 uh, years of that. So we are always in disadvantage. So we should study our own philosophy also, making our own university, and there is the money. Yes, but from our perspective also, yeah, our own university and stop to just intending to go to a European university to say, oh, I was in Europe, I studied there. Why I, I studied in Africa? Uh, Mali, uh, in the empire of Mali used to have super university, the best of the world. And Africa has uh, the one of the first university in the story of the world. Uh, and uh, there is the money problem also. We still depending on uh, IMF, that is a uh, European bank. Why Africa is so rich? Why we don't create our own bank, our own currency? 
Quit. Maybe I just want to, because all of this is making me think about a lot of the teachings that we have in our cultures. And I love the beauty of our diversity and our plurality. And I think that's extremely important. But one of the things that I think we need to do to survive and thrive collectively is also to unite. We need to unite around the marketing of the 1%. There's 1% of the population that is marketing worldviews. And there's a big portion that wants to be a little bit like them. And there's a little, a, another portion that wants to fight against them. But they're dividing us through this marketing. They're continuing to divide us through this marketing. So I think it's really about the unity. Believing in the power of plurality of identities. Fluidity of identities. How identities will continue to adapt and change. And how powerful the youth are in contemporalizing our traditions. And bringing a little bit of the seven past generations into the future seven generations to come. And making it beautiful and nice and aesthetic. So it represents the values. Because it's the values that we have to unite around. I don't care how we call it. It's all about the values of protecting the land and thinking of the future generations instead of solely the 1% marketing for their pocket. And that has nothing to do with the survival of us collectively as the humans. We are collective. In a lot of our indigenous languages, the names of our nation and of our tribes means human, yeah. means people, means you know, the four-legged ones that talk, you know? So, and we just have to unite around the four-legged ones that talk and understand that there's 1% of us that are creating division. And more and more we, we unite and find ways so that our pride, our diversity of voices, of choices, of views be valued and shown less and less the 1% of people that don't really care about the diversity. They want to put us all in an indigenous box, square, all in a little, and make us fight against each other to have a little piece of the box. So that's what all of this is reminding me. The seven generations, the teachings, the humanities, and, and just the, the power of the togetherness, the collectiveness around the common values that we share more than identity.
I understand life differently. Maybe. For me, the person has, has a meaning. For me, the time is not longer like past, present, and future. Maybe it's uh, future, present, and past. And I think it is interesting and like, say, uh, going again to modify the form of the making, destroy the form of the making to make it out of power. And that's why I have problems when I feel like um, a theme that involves my evolutionary preoccupation shaped in a Hollywood film. Mm -hmm. and shaped in a Hollywood formula, for example, in a way of framing that feeling. The, the only thing I ever see from this is capitalist description and extractivism instead of my understanding of reality which is shaped by my principles. So, so, so um, if I may add one more thing, um, I would like, you know, I, th I think the very radical things that have been said this evening have also been maybe the simplest, uh, which call back to our common humanity. Um, in my opinion, at least. Now, um, another thing that I think we need to shift, especially in relation to land, because we keep on talking about, you know, because the relation and the idea of the indigenous or who we are is very much related to two things. Us owning the land, one, and to cartography and maps which I find very complicated. So I think a shift that I think we need to propose, and which is something we've been trying to do in other projects here, like the agropoetics uh, project we did here, yeah, is to rethink the possibility of actually the land owning us. You know, we are just there. We act in destroying it or exploiting it you know, or, or, or acting within this uh, extractivist uh, economic logic, but the land actually owns us. And in the second part, in terms of cartography and maps, I think a lot of us try to have radical thoughts, but we've internalized the violent structures that have actually created us. Yeah. So we find ourselves within the logics of maps, of spaces. And I would like to just read a poem for you before I leave the stage, which is a poem by uh, a poet called Lee Maracle, if I pronounce it rightly, who's an indigenous, poet from, and she wrote a poem called Maps, which I found fascinating and I would like to read it to you. <laughs> so I wanted to avoid that because of the maps. <laughs> okay. Maps are others matching men to all places already seen. Maps conjure memories of spoil, of plunder, and innocence. Maps are journeys to illusions no one has learned from. Maps are critical revisits, visions of never before seen repeats. Maps direct intentions, call attention, and expose previous being. Maps scatter reflection and delude well-being. Maps flatten surfaces, time, distance, even height. Reduce critical illusions to trails of ink and color. Maps are pretentious, 
arrogantly purporting to know where everything is. Pretending power where none is. Maps are finite. Maps are always old. Maps never lead to uncharted places. Maps flip our attention from being to place. From metaphysical time to streets, roads, and clocks. Maps cheat our prospective response to depth. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. This is a conversation which it is urgent to continue and urgent to disseminate and urgent to take to everyone. Continue that as far as possible, as far as wide as possible. But for now, I think it's, this is a beautiful note to end on tonight. Thank you. And, and as we go, the delegation of Canada has to go. I'll sing us out because it is a traveling song and it helps you on your way.